In addition to singing, Grace studies acting and dance and is an active acro dancer. So Grace, whenever you're ready to start, we're all set. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot and love, and all of us command, car ton bras et porte le père, il se porte la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée, de plus brillant God keep our land glorious and free. Oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Grace, that was very entertaining. It was very well done, and it's obvious you have fun with your singing and it comes naturally to you. So on behalf of the city council and all the residents that are here, thank you very much. I'm sure you have a great career in singing. Okay, great job, honey. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, counselors, we are first going to start off with the adoption of the minutes from our August the 13th meeting, moved by Councillor Strange. Looking for a seconder for the minutes. Uh, Councillor Dabrowski seconds the minutes. If there's no discussions or amendments, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that's approved. Thank you. Uh, right off the hop here, we'll jump into everyone's favorite part of the meeting, the mayor's remarks. Uh, that was a joke, folks. It's okay. Um, we will do that. We will do that. Uh, first off, uh, we'll start off with obituaries. Uh, condolences regarding John Jack Stevenson, retired city employee who worked in the engineering department and was also a Niagara Falls Sports Wall of Fame inductee. Merle Bittner, father-in-law, and also Marty Martin, son-in-law of Lori Bittner, who works in our business development department. Also Ann Brennan, mother, and Kevin Brennan, brother of Jim Brennan in our municipal works department. And lastly, Ed Sherrar, former city and regional counselor, for City of Niagara Falls, who just passed away. On to a little more <coughs> light part of our announcement. Uh, this is coming up before our next council meeting. There'll be a special birthday we'll be celebrating. And of course, that'll be Councillor Wayne Thompson. He's got a special one coming up, I understand, in a couple of weeks. You've canceled it, have you? <laughs> so, well, they're all special, each one of them special. Uh, he's not out of century yet. No, he's got a ways to go for that. But it is a special, uh, I don't know, Councillor, did you want to mention which one it's going to be this year? Okay. <laughs> okay, what's that? I'm not going there. So we'll just move, we'll move on. Um, next, uh, it was a big week for Niagara Falls last week. Uh, we received official word from the federal government that we received Culture Hub funding. So for our, uh, both our Culture Hub and our Farmer's Market, we received three, $3 million from the federal government, and this is gonna help us create our space at Main and Ferry. It's been a long time coming, and this is gonna contribute toward the success of what we already have. So anyone in the arts and culture or interested in the Farmer's Market should be really, really pleased. And as well, later that same day, it was announced that the federal government was contributing $3 million for the Ryerson Innovation Zone That'll be part of our spark downtown in Niagara Falls. So we're really excited. This council has been working for years at this. We were turned down the first time. Uh, the second time we were successful. And some people were surprised we were staying at it, but we persevered and uh, we were successful. So we're grateful for the, the big announcements. Um, we'll be partnering with Ryerson. Incidentally, Ryerson has the number one incubator in the world. So it's nice when you can partner up with someone who knows how to do it. If you have a chance to go to the DMZ, 
the corner of Young and Dundas, you can see what a successful incubator looks like, and they're doing them all over the world through Ryerson. It's gonna help with youth retention, youth, attra youth attraction, and gonna help diversify our economy. Many council initiatives are accomplished with this project, and we're grateful. Upcoming events, the Niagara Falls Prayer Luncheon will be Friday, September the 27th at Club Italia. The guest speaker for the luncheon will be Basketball Hall of Fame and co-founder of the NBA's Orlando Magic, Pat Williams. So we're not sure if he was gonna still come after the Toronto Raptors eliminated them, uh, but luckily he's still in a good place and he's gonna come and speak at the uh, prayer luncheon. Used to be the mayor's uh, prayer breakfast and now it's just the prayer luncheon. The Parade of the Unknown Soldier will take place Saturday, September the 14th at 10.30 a.m. at the Fairview Cemetery. We'll be recognizing Niagara's unknown soldier as well as soldiers around the world who've paid the ultimate price for our freedom and democracy. Our community partner, the Royal Canadian Legion Branch 479, will be an integral part of the ceremonies. And this year, the service will also include the unveiling of a restored cenotaph from 1918 now set in the newest field of honor at the Fairview Cemetery. I'd like to also acknowledge council representations at different events around the city. Uh, First Councilor Peter Angelo, uh, representing the city at the Falls Pharmacy 30th Anniversary Celebration Dunk a Hunk at FamFest 30. <laughs> dunk, a, dunk a Hunk. <laughs> That's why I didn't get invited. They invited you. <laughs> Uh, ticket draw, uh, representing Ticket Draw at the Boys and Girls Club Open House and Chances for Children Lottery Draw. Thank you, Councillor Peter Angelo. Councillor Lococo for representing the city at the grand opening of Burgie and Friends. Councillor Dabrowski representing the city at the tree planting with Niagara Falls Tourism and the first pitch at the Ontario Baseball Association Tournament, uh, as well as the Porsche Taycan North American World Premier. You probably heard that. Porsche unveiled their new electric vehicle in only three locations around the world, and one of them was right here in Niagara Falls. And as well, representing us at the, and bringing greetings at Niagara to Israel with love. And lastly, Councilor Strange, representing the city at the, also, the Falls Pharmacy 30th Anniversary Celebration Dunk a Hunk. I spent 20 bucks trying to say Councilor Peter Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Also, the 65th anniversary of Bill and Doris Mann certificate presentation and the Skin Tag Association of Niagara. So, thank you very much, Councillor, for representing us at these events. Yes, Councillor? Your Worship, he asked me to tag along to that event, but I was worried about getting tied up. I didn't know what they'd do there, so maybe he can explain. <laughs> He's turning a little bit red right now, so I'm not really sure. Um, I sent the letter to your house. Uh, explaining the whole situation, so hopefully you got it. Okay, that's great, thank you. Uh, and notice, notice the next council meeting will be Tuesday, October the 1st. So mark it in your calendar. I know everybody's very excited. You don't want to miss one of these babies. I'm just gonna, uh, I don't forget about Terry Fox. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Did you want to make, go ahead, make that noise. Uh, this coming Sunday will be the Terry Fox run, which will take place at the uh, Gale Center. So hopefully everybody uh, can show up, get their pledge, pledges filled out and come along. It's just a 5K walk, run, jog, cycle, walk the dog, whatever the case may be. It's fun, it's interactive, and uh, it's easy. So it's not a competition. So thanks for the reminder, Councilor, appreciate that. Uh, next up, uh, we are looking for disclosures of a pecuniary interest. You have any disclosures? Yes, Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, None from this meeting, but from last meeting I was absent. Uh, August 13th meeting, uh, Niagara Catholic District School Board, my employer. A couple checks there, 0028-0004 and 0027-0007. Okay, thank you very much. We'll hand those in to the clerk. Any other disclosures? Yes, Councillor Kerry. Thank you, Worship. Uh, 6.5, waste collection. Mr. Berlin, I think, is gonna make a presentation. I'm uh, I have third party private collections, so I'm going to declare a conflict. Okay, it's noted. Any other disclosures? Okay, seeing none, we'll move along to presentations and appointments. In our first presentation, we have Ann Radicic, <coughs> Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of Alzheimer's Society. So you're here to make a presentation. Welcome, yes. Ann. Thank you. Oops. Oops. I just broke the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, good evening, Mayor Diodati, members of council, city staff, members of the public. Uh, again, my name is Ann Radicic, and I am the vice chair of the board of directors for the Alzheimer's Society Niagara Foundation. <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this evening to uh, remind everybody about our annual Alzheimer's Coffee Break campaign now in its 24th year. So uh, this year, our Coffee Break campaign kicks off Friday, September 20th in St. Catharines at Niagara Regional Headquarters offices with coffee and treats. Uh, it will be hosted by the 2019 Honorary Chair Jim Bradley, also the Regional Chair of Niagara. There will be an official flag raising and from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. everyone is invited to come and enjoy coffee and treats to show your support for the Alzheimer's Society of Niagara Region. So uh, Alzheimer's disease, already the seventh leading cause of death in Canada, continues to grow as a public health concern as the number of Canadians with dementia rises. The latest statistics from Alzheimer's Canada indicate that as of today, there are over half a million Canadians living with dementia, plus about 25,000 new cases diagnosed every single year. The combined healthcare system and out-of-pocket caregiver costs are estimated at $10.4 billion per year to care for people living with dementia. And dementia, it doesn't discriminate. It can affect anyone regardless of background, education, lifestyle, or status. And um, uh, not well known, it is actually not a part of normal aging. It is one of the fastest growing diseases of our time. It still has no cure or effective treatments. Dementia is also a health condition with important social implications that affect our communities. There's often a lack of awareness and understanding of dementia, resulting in stigmatization and, bar uh, and barriers to diagnosis and care. In the Niagara region, there are over 10,000 people experiencing progressive dementia and the number of cases continues to grow. Last year, we saw 2,056 new referrals to our society and educated more than 12,500 Niagara residents and frontline staff. Our service provision includes all individuals affected by the diagnosis of dementia, spouses, families, children, and friends who also need education and support to facilitate lifestyle, health, and wellness changes for their family member. The Alzheimer's Society of Niagara Region is a recognized leader in the field of dementia care. Our vision is a community where individuals with dementia and their care partners are fully supported to maximize their quality of life and well-being. We enhance safety and independence within the home and community, strengthen resilience and coping capacity, and ensure that people living with dementia continue to participate in family and community life for as long as possible. We offer people living with dementia a welcoming place where they can access information and support as well as connect with others who share a similar experience. By accessing education, personalized in-home support services, and wellness programs, families can better understand dementia, navigate the health system, and access the resources they need when they need them at every stage of the dementia journey. We've had wonderful success with our many programs and services offered out in the community, such as brainwave cafes, support groups, minds in motion, friendly visiting, telecare friendly visiting, aging and dementia simulations, and numerous other educational series. Our family support counselors do in-home visits in every municipality in the Niagara region. If you are interested in finding out about any of the programs or support services offered, please do not hesitate to check out the website alzheimersniagara.ca. However, to support a large variety of programs that are provided at no charge to individuals or their families, our society must raise over $500,000 each year, and Coffee Break is one of our biggest events. Coffee Breaks are an opportunity to invite your friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, clients, or customers to come together to enjoy a cup of coffee or other beverage, if you like tea, hot chocolate, wine, anyone, and even treats at a time uh, at a break time or another social get-together in exchange for making a donation to support the work of your local Alzheimer's Society. Now hosting a coffee break is easy to organize and provides a fun social opportunity. Our society supplies each host with a free kit while hosts supply the people and place. The kit includes coffee for that first pot, supplied locally by Barclay and Todd's, signage and literature, as well as a donation box to support each event, and some promotional items from our sponsors. 
Giant Tiger St. Catharines locations, JNL Flooring, and Seniors on the Move organization. Coffee break events are held in homes, workplaces, community centers, schools, churches, city halls, stores, and businesses. Just about anywhere you can imagine a social gathering taking place and where coffee, other beverages, and food and goodies can be served and a donation collected. Can't forget the donations. Some of the most successful events have been a result of doing something a little different, whether it's a barbecue, open house, raffle, dress down days at work, selling coffee cup cutouts at the, ca uh, the checkout counter, or donating your change when cashing out. Every nickel counts. September 21st is World Alzheimer's Day, and popular attractions across the country are going blue for alts. In the Niagara region, the Falls, the Peace Bridge, and Wellness Canal Bridge 13 are all going to be illuminated blue. We invite you to wear blue that day in support of those living with dementia, and even host your own coffee break right on World, uh, World Alzheimer's Day. The campaign does run from September right through December 31st, so loss of time to choose an event date that is convenient for you. No coffee break event is too big or too small, and each truly makes a difference in the lives of those living with the effects of dementia in the <coughs> Niagara region. Thanks to this council and over 100 hosts, including Hoco Limited, Meadows of Dorchester, and Harvey's Restaurant, to name a few Niagara Falls hosts, we raised close to $60,000 last year. Organizing or taking part in a coffee break event in your community not only raises much needed funds, but it raises awareness and encourages discussion about Alzheimer's disease and dementia. You ensure that individuals and their families, your loved ones, friends, and neighbors know that they are not alone in their journey. Please consider hosting a coffee break event this year and make your coffee count. It's fun and easy, a uh, great way to show your support for the Alzheimer's Society. Anyone can register for a free coffee break kit by calling the Alzheimer's Society of Niagara at 905 687-3914 or by visiting the website at www.alzheimerniagara.ca forward slash coffee break. So thank you very much for your time this evening and your consideration in making a difference in your community today and to making memories better. Mary Dia Daddy, can I present you with your coffee break kit? Of course. I'll come down there. I've got a couple more in case anybody wants one. So we will receive this. Thank you very much. Thank you. And and uh, we'll have a coffee break here at the city. We'll collect money for Alzheimer's as well. And we'll be part of the solution. Thank, Thank you very much. much. That's great. Did we have any questions from Ms. Radicek of council? You know. So good luck. I know it's a combination of awareness and fundraising until we get to, toward a cure. And it's good that we're identifying it now, you know. And, and, and the other thing I hear so often is that it comes younger and younger. You start seeing signs, and there are things that you can do to avert it or minimize it. And hopefully, by being aware of that, people can be proactive instead of waiting till it's too late. It's a terrible, terrible way for people to suffer. So thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we've got a presentation now: uh, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month proclamation. So I understand we've got Brett Wales here. Uh, Brett's here. Yeah, if you'd like to come up. Brett, father of Reed, and uh, of course Reed was uh, one of the marshals for the candidate parade. So we welcome. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you to Council and Mayor Diodati for allowing me to address you this evening. Um, I'd like to just take this opportunity to let you know why um, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month is important not only to my family but several others <coughs> in the community. Um, I, I, I did, uh, is the video going to play, or has it played yeah, already yep. on your... Whenever you're ready. Yep. Oh, okay. Do you well, want us to play now? Yeah, sure. We'll watch the video now. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> our life this is our song we'll fight the powers that be just don't pick our destiny cause you don't know us you don't belong
pretty powerful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. that um, video wasn't provided for your sympathy, rather it's for your understanding to, to get an idea of why we do what we do as parents. Um, having a child diagnosed and treated with cancer literally takes a, a community to get you through it. Um, we've certainly witnessed that uh, through our own son's diagnosis, treatment and recovery. Um, you know, you've involved him in city events such as being a Grand Marshal in the uh, Canada Day Parade this year, um, various uh, events that have brought the community out uh, from Heaters Heroes, KO for Kids, and events like that. Um, Niagara Falls really steps up to, to the plate when it comes to supporting their own uh, families. Um, what I want like to do today is, is just try and raise awareness of childhood cancer and I'd like to do that in two ways. Uh, first I'd like to ask the support of Niagara Falls Council to officially recognize September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month and, and join a growing number of communities in the, across the country and around the world. And secondly, I'm seeking uh, your support and permission uh, to start uh, participating in a project called the Gold Bike Project Canada. Um, can't really, well, maybe you can. Uh, sorry, Jim, thanks. This, this is uh, part of the, this is actually Reed's tricycle from the time he was diagnosed and treated. Uh, we spray painted it gold. The idea with the Gold Bike Project Canada is that these bikes are, are painted up either by families or members of the community and left in, in random spaces um, to raise awareness of childhood cancer. It's got the hashtag Gold Bike Project Canada on there. It's not to raise money, it's just to raise awareness. Uh, hopefully the idea is that people go home and get the understanding that that bike represents uh, a child who can't ride it, who's had their childhood taken away from them, um, either because they're being treated for cancer, they're too sick in the hospital, or worse. Um, so that in turn raises the awareness that, that means so much to the families in the community. Um, no community is immune to childhood cancer. Um, September's Childhood Cancer Awareness Month for some, but for some families, so are the remaining 11 months. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. So before you run away, uh, we're looking for a motion. Yes, Councillor Strange. Yeah, um, I'll move the motion that we declare uh, Childhood Cancer Month in Niagara Falls goal, um, as well as uh, to uh, to start the bike, uh, I don't know what we call it, the gold bike um, Childhood Cancer Month, where you're, are we, are we having this bike at McBain Center? I, I imagine, is that what they... Yeah, uh, that's where the, the suggestion came Okay, about. and then maybe if we can even add it to a uh, motion, add it to our website, and if someone else wants to put a bike somewhere else on one of the other city officials, or city uh, uh, facilities, that, that they may do that too, something with the Gale Center, something like that, to recognize uh, uh, Child <coughs> Cancer Month. Um, you really hit up the heartstrings, that's for sure, that video. <laughs> but uh, is Reed here? Could we, yeah. can we get Reed up? I just want to recognize Reed, and he was at Canada uh, Parade as, as a marshal. And uh, Reed, come on up, buddy. But there's come a couple, daddy. couple warriors sitting yeah. back there. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll introduce Bookie <laughs> okay. right after. Well, Lucy, you can bring him. But if, if people don't know the story, he was diagnosed at two and a half years old with uh, with leukemia, and uh, um, probably the worst nightmare a parent can actually live through. and um, But this guy has, has fought through everything, the chemo, all the treatments, uh, going up to uh, McMaster Children's Hospital, and they're staying at Ronald McDonald's, which is a great facility. And uh, this kid is an inspiration. He's an inspiration to other children. He's an inspiration to all of us here today because he proved that he could knock out cancer, and his dad proved that he could help out. and with benefits like this and, and awareness and actually boxing our kill for kids last year did an amazing job and uh, so just want to thank you for for coming out here and uh, and getting the awareness out so so just the motion I guess to uh, declare child cancer month uh, for September mm -hmm. our goal the path uh, route I guess from each city facility if we can if we have a couple more gold bikes and maybe we can put it on our uh, on our website as well okay for, uh, for awareness so Okay, that's great. So we've got the motion by Councillor Strange that September would be Childhood uh, Cancer Awareness Month and the gold bikes uh, be allowed at our city facilities and advertised as well. So seconded by Councillor Campbell. If there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that's, of course, unanimously approved. So thanks very much, Brett. We really appreciate your presentation. And Reed, good seeing you again, buddy. Want to say something? Does he want to say something? 
See you being shy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, this looks like it's a little bit of a theme for uh, for tonight. So, item six point three, camp out for cancer. So, we have Pam Isaac here, the organizer. Organizer, I'm sorry, of camp out for cancer event. Uh, is Pam here? Okay. Pam's going to address council on I'm the here, idea. I'm here, but my my cuter, smaller version uh, <laughs> is really what matters. Um, we're really, really grateful to be here today and uh, hot on the heels of. Uh, Brett's presentation, I think uh, Council can truly understand uh, that childhood cancer is a journey that no family wants to endure, but many families have no choice but to. Uh, when Brookie was about five and a half, she was diagnosed with neuroblastoma, and you saw her in some of those pictures of the video, and um, we're a very lucky family with a very positive prognosis. Um, part of what we do now as a family is try and uh, support the causes that have supported our family. Uh, and one of those causes is Camp Trillium. And so you can read a little bit about uh, Camp Trillium in the proposal um, that was set before you here today. But essentially Camp Trillium is a place that's 35 years old and it uh, has been um, you know, run for all these years thanks to private donations from service clubs and individuals and organizations. And it's for the entire family affected by childhood cancer. So this is a place, uh, there's actually two sites. Rainbow Lake is up in uh, Waterdown and or island is actually on a little island you got to take a boat to get there uh, and it's up in prince edward county and it's a place for um children uh, it's a place for parents it's a place for siblings uh, it really encompasses the entire family and so uh, once kids reach uh, the age of eight whether they be in treatment whether they be survivors or whether they be uh the kids that are that are left behind with angels for siblings they're able to attend camp trillium uh, for a week uh, they have summer camps fall and winter camps as well uh, and they also offer family programming. So they have uh, family camps as well. Uh, and we've been really fortunate as a family to attend those camps. Um, and I can tell you, I wouldn't have met Brett, uh, Lucy, and Reed without Camp Trillium. And you know, we're from the Niagara region, as are they. Uh, our home hospital is uh, McMaster Children's, and that's the hospital uh, for this entire Niagara region. Uh, the families who endure this journey uh, connect, and, and we really do try and work together. <laughs> Uh, to raise awareness uh, and, and funds. So uh, we're here today very humbly asking uh, for use of Fireman Park in October uh, for, for one overnight evening. We have talked to this uh, Stanford Center volunteer uh, firefighters who have said with your blessing they feel confident and comfortable in us. Uh, essentially Camp Out for Cancer is uh, Camp Trillium's um, gold star initiative to try and raise funds uh, for their programming and essentially families uh, register they raise money and they camp out or they do some fun camp activities um, which raise money for camp uh, so families can attend at no cost and I can tell you kids in treatment are there uh, all the time and they have nurses on site so kids can um, you know take their chemo or be watched for fevers or things when when you know life's tough um, and what's really special about Camp Trillium is that most of the staff there who are referred to as special friends uh, were uh, cancer kids or siblings of cancer kids themselves and so this place is just so special that everybody keeps coming back. Um, and so it's a real blessing for Niagara families. And I can say with great certainty that Niagara Falls leads the way in really supporting our childhood cancer community, uh, be it KO for Kids, be it Heaters Heroes. Um, we're really grateful uh, for the support. So we're here before you guys tonight just simply asking if we can use Fairman's Park. It's a private uh, event just for Camp Trillium <coughs> families. Uh, it is an alcohol-free event. It is just uh, for families, and essentially, it's like a night of camp, uh, as it would be at Camp Trillium. So we'll play games. We might go fishing. Hopefully, it'll be warm enough. Um, we'll have the opportunity to do some skits and some music, pitch some tents, uh, spend the night uh, in fellowship, uh, celebrate our fundraising for Camp Trillium, uh, maybe raise a little bit of awareness on on, on the on the way in and the way out, uh, and then clean ourselves up and head out uh, the next day. So that's our ask. That's great, thank you. Councillor Strange. Well, I'll obviously make the motion to, to make that happen. Um, I just want to commend you guys, and I've known Berkey for so long. And people don't know this young, which, what's your nickname? Berkey. What's, what's your, your nickname? nickname? Warrior Princess. Warrior Princess, because she definitely is a warrior okay. princess. She really is, she is a princess. Neuroblastoma, when she was only five years old, and what was the size of the tumor that he got? About a fist. About a fist. So just really unbelievable that she had to go through all that and, and the treatments and now she is uh, is helping others and helping families and I didn't really know too much about uh,
Camp Trillium, but they are just amazing, and they get to use it until they're 18 years old, and their families. Well, you know what the best thing is, Mr. Mayor, is no social media. Oh, so perfect. They go there, there's no phones, no nothing. They get to join themselves, and just like a camp, there's so many <coughs> volunteers, and they're helping them out singing songs, doing great stuff, and being mm -hmm. on the lake, so it's an amazing, amazing thing. And actually, Brookie just made me, they did a little fundraiser, and she made myself, <laughs> I get the family package with the bracelets here. <laughs> We've got ours on too, right? That, oh, you, oh, yours is here. We've got ours too. Do you want to talk about what? Sure, yeah. Our family's been working hard to raise money for Camp Trillium. We've raised, we're actually $80 short of making our $2,000 goal, and we're stretching to try and raise $3,000 for Camp Trillium this year. It well, does cost. Has, you know, okay, maybe you need some bracelets. Like 80 bucks, right? <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, we know that it costs about $150 a day per child to attend Camp Trillium. That includes all the food and lodging and the activities and things that go on. So a uh, part of what Brooklyn and her brothers did uh, last month was they actually made these little bracelets uh, that they were selling to family and friends and uh, managed to raise almost $1,000 on their bracelets, uh, which I thought was pretty fantastic. So, yeah. And if you can let us know whatever we can add to the event as far as or anything, I, I'm, I'm sure any kind of or, or anything products or anything we have with the city that we could help out with that day, I'm sure we could do that too. I'd like to make a motion for that too. If you need you. anything at all, donations, whatever it is, food, marshmallows, whatever you guys do. We, so. uh, we do know lots about burnt marshmallows, eh? We've been doing some fundraising with burnt marshmallows <laughs> and videos as well. Um, we're really grateful uh, uh, for your consideration and support. It's, again, it's going to be a private event. It's not something which is open to the general public. It is an alcohol-free event. It's for families. And it's really just a, a celebration of the fundraising and uh, the fellowship that comes with the, the childhood cancer community. Well, it's a great event, and hopefully this is the start of many at Fireman's Park because it's a great place for some. Like it's, it's a perfect location. It really, it really is, is for this. Yeah. So I'll Thank just you. make that motion and to put it on our website as well. Okay, we've got a motion by Councillor Strange and a second by Councillor Peter Angelo that we honor the request to use Fireman's Park for the fundraising event for Camp Out for Cancer and uh, support not just Brookie, but everybody that's in her situation. So we're happy to call that vote. All those in favor? And as you can see, it's Thank fully you. supported. So we look Thank forward you. to the event. Thank you. We're yeah, I love the idea of no Thank social you. media. That's the best part. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And keeping with tonight's theme, I inv invite Tiffany Aiello up, the founder of Team Niagara Lymphoma of Niagara Falls to present to council re regarding events surrounding Lymphoma Awareness Week in September. I'm just coming up for the good looks. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. I'm going to uh, pass around, there's a coloring book and a package of crayons, a button there if you want to pass around. The Tim Hauser. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. He's now a new board member. Excellent. <laughs> Floor is yours. Right. Mayor and Council, thank you for allowing me once again. My name is still Tiffany, and I still have cancer. Lymphoma, which is a cancer of the lymphatic system, and my type of lymphoma has no cure. The best that can be done is masking of the symptoms and the management of the pain. However, I refuse to let this illness dictate the rest of my life regarding or regardless of not knowing how many months or years that may be. And I want others to know that even after isolation starts to set in, no one should have to fight alone. As a young mom raising a family, I quickly found that many others were in a similar, similar situation, yet few resources were available. And sometimes the greatest resource is just having someone to talk to. I set out to make the best of my living the new norm and was committed to not letting anything slow me down. People were surprised to hear the statistics or the stats that lymphoma is diagnosed in more than 9,000 people every year and currently just in Canada there are over 43,000 people living or sorry 43,000 people who are battling or in remission with lymphoma. Even with those startling numbers it hadn't really grabbed attention the way other forms of cancer had. We strive to change that through last year's illumination and beyond. In January of this year, I formed a non-profit organization, Team Niagara Lymphoma Awareness and Assistance, and have been overwhelmed with how many people have reached out 
and like myself who are or have been battling a lymphoma cancer diagnosis. Our objectives are providing financial assistance to individuals undergoing treatment for lymphoma, lymphoma to cover expenses such as gas and parking, facilitating involvement in social activities for those individuals and their families, promoting and participating in community events to raise awareness. And it is the community events that help us generate the funds required to assist with the first two objectives. It has been a roller coaster ride so far. I don't fear dying of cancer because I know that leading a nonprofit organization will be the death of me along before the lymphoma takes me out. <laughs> but in all seriousness, thank you to my family and friends and supporters from far and wide for their support. Some of them are able to be here tonight and I am deeply appreciative for their continued encouragement. It has been well worth it and we have accomplished a lot in a short period of time. Since my last time before you, we have launched our coloring information booklets designed to educate kids and families on the importance of their lymph nodes and overall lymphatic system. We call it Know Your Nodes Campaign. They feature our mascot, Leonard the Lymphoma Lizard. Leonard is also fe featured in a series of clothing, which I have here today, and merchandise that we are launching right now. These items generate much needed funds so we can assist the families on our waiting list for the services. As we approach the weekend of lymphoma awareness, this coming Saturday and Sunday, I would like to draw everyone's attention to two events we are holding. Saturday, <coughs> September 14th, our Bash at the Boathouse is a benefit fundraising being held, or fundraiser, sorry, being held at the Boathouse restaurant and patio in Chippewa, starting at 7 p.m. Featuring a great local band, Barracuda Pretty, food refreshments, and a lot of raffle prizes. I would like to sincerely thank Counselor Campbell for his efforts in helping us secure prizes and donations. Tickets are available as well at the door. On Sunday, September 15th, we are having our first annual Light the Night Ride for Lymphoma, starting at the Boathouse. We are expecting dozens of motorcycles to join us for food, drink specials, and raffles before lighting their bikes <coughs> green, well, lime green, and making their way down the Niagara Parkway in show of support. That night of the 15th, we will be ending with the illumination of the falls at 10 p.m. Thank you to the illumination board for their support. It is a truly, it is truly an amazing sight to see the falls lit lime green. Inspiration for those battling lymphoma and an opportunity to remember those who unfortunately are no longer with us. We will be down there at 9.30 outside Table Rock House. Look for all the lime green. If all goes well, these events, along with others, we have done throughout the year, ongoing partnership fundraisers throughout the community and personal donations, we will have achieved our goal of raising enough funds to assist five families on our service waiting list. All you have to do is ask around and someone you know or are connected to has either lymphoma or a similar blood cancer. Those individuals need all the help they can get. Thank you to those who have supported Team Niagara Lymphoma Awareness and Assistance. Over our first six months, we need all the support we can get. I hope to see our community support us this weekend, and we are always grateful for a member of the council to find time to join us, even if it's just for a short while. We would be thrilled to have you. That's great, <laughs> thank you. Do you have any questions uh, for Tiffany of council? I think if you should, if anyone speak to this, if anybody, what you've gone through. Well, you seem to be our cancer spokesperson <laughs> for uh, for the city, and I appreciate you know uh, going through a similar thing, uh, what you're doing, and again, it's a combination of things. It's awareness, and what you can do to deal with it and prevent it, and minimize it, and then of course treatment, and uh, hopefully one day cure. So uh, yes, Councillor Campbell. I, I would like to, to say that. Uh, uh, the community has 
been really responsive in a positive way. Uh, I took it upon myself to reach out through the Chamber of Commerce and um, I, I think that I'm even blown away with the amount of donations that we've received. And I'd like to say, thank the community for that, it's been awesome. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you very much, Councillor. So um, uh, now you've got the specific week here, is there anything, so you've already got everything arranged, the falls, the turning yep. lights, everything's already arranged. Yep. So we wanna encourage everybody to do whatever they can for the September 13th through 15th to wear lime the green. The 14th. I'm and sorry, the on the 14th itself? Well, the 15th is uh, World Lymphoma Awareness Day, okay. recognized all over the world. So last year you helped me. <laughs> proclaimed that in Niagara Falls the first year. So t this year is our second year proclaiming in Niagara Falls. Okay, so that's gonna be on Sunday, September the 15th. So we're looking for an announcement of an endorsement from council to proclaim uh, Sunday, September the 15th, Lymphoma Awareness Day in Niagara Falls. So that's moved by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Cario. We have any discussion to that motion? So we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous again. So thank good you. luck and thank you for what you're doing to spread awareness. Thank and you. Make sure funds. you do your coloring work. <laughs> yes, we will for sure. In the lines or out of the lines? Uh, wherever you like. Okay. Next on the agenda, now we had a, a deputation request from United Way. They're not gonna be here, but what they have asked us to do is they, they have a flag raising request that Thursday, September the 19th for one week period that we put up the United Way flag uh, at City Hall. So moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. We'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanim unanimously as well. What's that? I did, that's, you're right. Uh, 6.5, waste collection tender. Uh, we've got a uh, member of our business community, Charlie Berland, who's the president of the Niagara Clifton Group, would like to speak to Council regarding the commercial waste fee. Welcome, Mr. Berland. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Jim Diodati, um, members of council and uh, city staff. I'll make this quite quick. Um, as we all know, the Niagara region is currently um, revamping the waste collection system. And I reached out to them and then they sent me to the city and I've been working with Ken Todd's office, um, wondering if businesses in Niagara Falls could possibly opt out of uh, being uh, the waste fee um, for those of us that do not use the um, government uh, the municipal collection system. Um, so what's, hap what's happening to our business, and probably many of the businesses in Niagara Falls, is we get a, a fee, um, and then in our case, depending on the year, it's between 20 or $30,000 which we have to pay as it's part of the tax bill. But we also, but we use third party for pickup. And um, the CAO's office told me one of the steps that needs to happen um, is for me to come here and ask council um, to uh, put a motion on the floor and I guess direct staff to continue to investigate it, um, whether it's something that could happen with the revamp of the regional waste system. Well, that's great. Um, I've got Councillor Thompson. Yes, um, I don't know how many years ago, but uh, when I was sitting up there, uh, we were having trouble with our budgets with respect to uh, waste collection. And uh, I started working on getting the region to take over the responsibility rather than the municipality. And we were successful for that and the change took place and there was never any discussion, debate by council <coughs> about the uh, fees for businesses. And uh, I found out uh, sometime later that uh, the people were paying the fee in the uh, business community, but they were using private collection. So it was uh, suggested, well, just leave it alone. Uh, it's been going on for many, many years, and uh, with the changes that, that are taking place at the region, I think it's appropriate 
to uh, have a motion going to our senior staff to really report back to us about the impact that this is going to have because it's going to be substantial. If uh, you're talking about uh, your property's $30,000, that's not insignificant. And uh, maybe it's something that uh, we can do or maybe because our budget is already set for this year, something it come in next year. Uh, but uh, for a long period of time, the uh, business community have been uh, charged this fee without having any collection. So I think your request is reasonable and uh, I think the council uh, should have a report back uh, to determine exactly uh, what they're going to do with this and the timing of it. So I would so move. Okay, that's moved by, uh, are you seconded, Councilor? Okay, moved by Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Lococo, that we forward the um, waste collection our, uh, uh, and also recycle, I'm assuming too, that's part, is this part of it? Yeah. yeah, it would be all waste, yeah. So all waste, including recycling back to staff for a report to council to come back with the impact and also we're going to obviously have to confer with the region so right now the region within the next two weeks is going to be issuing an rfp for waste collection throughout the region and i believe that'll close sometime in october so there's and there's about a year lag time till it kicks in the new contracts are going to kick in so it's a good time actually to be rethinking this because uh, the whole region is going through a complete change we had a lot of problems as you know over the last uh, couple of years with the current collector and it's probably a great time to do that. I would, I would think that most municipalities would want to do the same thing. Um, and by doing it at this particular time, it's not, it's, it would start with the new contract so they would be able to calculate things somewhat ahead of time and it, it wouldn't be that these fees would be dumped on residents or anything like that. It would just lower the actual total cost of the, the waste pickup. Yeah, no, obviously the impact would be a part they got to look at for sure, how to, how they fund it. So if there's, yes, Councillor or Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, just so I'm clear, are we asking that uh, this be included as an enhanced service that businesses get coverage pickup, or are we asking that the actual fee get removed from, uh, I guess, business tax bills? I think that we're asking. Because there's a difference. I, mean, I think staff would, I would think, come back with both options, uh, Mr. No. CAO. Sure. Well, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I think what we'll have to do is have that conversation with the region. I'm not sure they're going to include large commercial, which, which these properties are included in across the region, whether they want to include that. Um, we'll ask that question. I think it's going to be more of a, uh, a funding mechanism and in, in how that, that is funded and what that impact is. Thanks, Your Worship. Okay, so just to follow up then, um, we're not asking for commercial to be included as an enhanced service. And I, I don't think that's what they're asking for either. I, I think, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you're, they're happy with their private contractors. Right. They just don't want to have to pay for a service they're not getting. Right. That's, that's and I can appreciate Your Worship, yeah. uh, where Mr. Berlin's coming from. I mean, I've heard it from other people as well. It, 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 it's not like someone who, um, doesn't have children, so it doesn't use the hockey arenas or the library. Uh, in this case here, there is a service that's provided, um, but they're being told that they can't access the service, but that they have to pay for it. So I thought I fully support the report coming back. Okay. Yeah. Do we have any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. And we had a, a conflict with Councilor Carrio. All right, Mr. Berlin, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, item 6.7, this is our last uh, two presentations. We have a request by Mr. Kenneth Westhues, who's going to speak to us regarding bed and breakfast operations. Uh, he's got five minutes, and as well, uh, Mr. Pinter, John Pinter, is he here as well? Sorry, oh, in the corner, okay, sorry. Uh, he'll also have five minutes, so if you wanna step forward, Mr. Westhues, welcome.
Don't start the clock yet, Mr. Clerk. He's just getting his water. <laughs> Mr. Mayor and members of council, my name's Ken Westhues. I live at 5419 River Road. Don't you wish that all the matters that came before this council were things that everybody could agree about, like the earlier items on tonight's agenda? But the trouble is that some items that come before council are things that not everybody agrees about, and this is one of them. Thank you for permitting me to address you. Routinely, people stand at this lectern asking you to enact some kind of bylaw. I've come to ask you to direct your staff to enforce a bylaw you enacted already in 2015. Unlike most bylaws, this one has not been enforced. That's why I'm here. It's bylaw 2015 to regulate the development of an inn, Niagara Grandview Manor, owned by John Pinter, at the corner of Eastwood and River Road. This is the only bylaw that authorizes Mr. Pinter to use any of his properties in our neighborhood for a commercial purpose. Otherwise, ours is a residential neighborhood with a delightful mix of grand heritage homes and well-kept modest homes, owners and long-term renters, young families, empty nesters, singles. About 15% of residents operate legal bed and breakfasts in their homes. I'm showing you the nine homes closest to the inn. Eight are owner-occupied, one of them a bed and breakfast. The ninth is long-term rentals owned by the couple next door. In the midst of these homes is Niagara Grandview Manor. Bylaw 2015-51 states that it is not a bed and breakfast, not a hotel, not a motel, not a restaurant, that it is an inn with up to 12 rooms where guests may be provided with food. Mr. Pinter has violated this law flagrantly for about three years. He has acquired at least six additional homes, all zoned residential, and illegally expanded the inn to include them so that he rents not 12, but 25 or 30 rooms in what amounts to a multi-building motel. There's two of them. Here's three more. He has given these homes commercial names as shown on the slides. Mr. Pinter maintains a website called Niagara Historic Inns, plural, which he says can sleep 65 persons. This map shows locations of the homes he has turned into his motel. There you can see the legal inn. Next to it is one home then two he doesn't control, then three in a row that he does, then skip one, then another, plus houses on John Street. Plainly, Niagara Grandview Manor is one business on six properties. All guests register at the main building and eat a free breakfast there. Mr. Pinter assured the city last year that only guests registered at Niagara Grandview Manor will be eating inside the facility's dining room. That is true. No matter which of the six buildings, the one that is legal or the five that are not, the guests are staying in. We in the River Road Heritage neighborhood do not want an illegal motel in our midst. Would any of you, Mr. Mayor or Councilors, want Mr. Pinter's business in your neighborhood? No. You would do what eight residents of our neighborhood did in May of 2017, almost two and a half years ago. In polite letters, we ask city staff to enforce bylaw 2015-51 and limit Niagara Grandview Manor to 12 rooms on the one property where it is legal. Our request was to no avail. We have been stonewalled and given the runaround on the issue ever since. This evening, I come with a petition signed by 34 residents. Maybe you could pass that to the clerk, please asking that City Council, quote, ensure immediate enforcement of bylaw 2015-51. This bylaw limits Niagara Grandview Manor to 12 rooms at one location and excludes serving meals to anyone lodged elsewhere. In closing, you may choose to take no action, 
to extend Mr. Pinter's free ride for another year or so, give him time to better establish his motel, perhaps take over more homes as he has already tried to do, or perhaps sell the multi-building business as he has already tried to do, meanwhile running more residents out of the neighborhood and further undermining its residential character. But if one of you will make a motion to have the bylaw enforced and the rest of you will pass it, you will do more than limit Niagara Grandview Manor to the one property where it is legal. You will send a message to your staff and to residents all across the city that you expect the bylaws you enact to be enforced even-handedly without favoritism, a message also that you will keep residents of all residential neighborhoods safe from illegal commercial intrusion. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Westhus. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Westhus? Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. And we're gonna <coughs> extend the same courtesy to Mr. Pinter. And if he'd like to come forward, and we'll give him the same amount of time. Mr. Pinter, I didn't touch the water, so you've been no working if you want. <laughs> Well, thanks for the opportunity. I wouldn't know where to start with this. Um, we arrived on the River Road scene in 2014, and I strongly object to the notion that we're running a motel. Our operations of Niagara Historic Inns are one as all follows. You know, the total investment on River Road is now exceeding five and a half million dollars, with approximately another million and a half to go into these buildings. Um, our client base there is one-third Canadian, one-third U.S., one-third international. Our staff can speak 10 languages. We service those people in 10 different languages. We collect and remit all levels of taxes, HST, and we will be collecting the tourist levy uh, starting in 2020. We feature daily maid service to the buildings. Every building that we have under our belt is, gets daily maid service, and we do have a 24-7 on-site presence in our buildings. Our satellite home rentals uh, throughout in our area are average only 5.5 persons on an average nightly basis. And the main purpose for those families renting those houses are the common spaces in between. They're not necessarily jamming 10, 12 people. That's been so much of the problems in other parts of the city. Our business continues to expand. We count Microsoft, AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals, Premier Mortgage as some of our corporate clients as we continue to tap into the small meeting market. The process that we have on River Road is one where the guests do check in in the main building. We vet all reservations, they come in, they check in, we give them the standard tourist orientation, we orientate them to the breakfast, we schedule their times, and they do come back the next day. The breakfast is a very high level breakfast that comes with a buffet, three or four pastries, three or four fruits, the standard coffee, tea, juices, and the night before the guests pick a choice of seven entrees that they can have. So it's prepared by a chef, and you're not <coughs> going to find too many motels who serve anything like that. The, the issue of compliance, well, if we speed fast forward, you know, in 20, April 2018, when council voted to ban the short-term rentals in the residential areas of the city, we immediately engaged the Niagara Planning Group and John Hendricks. For those who are new to council, compliance is a relatively slow and lengthy process. I, as an individual, even if I know what to do, I'm not allowed to write the, app, the planning reports. I can't do it. We have to engage another organization, a certified planner. So therefore, we are at the mercy of their schedules. They have a high level client base. We have to work with survey companies in order to fulfill the application. And finally, we have to work with city staff according to their schedules. We've been at this for over one year, and within the next two to three weeks, we'll be filing a very rock solid foundation of a site specific zoning application, which will serve as a model for the short term rental industry moving forward, not only in the falls, but probably right across Ontario and Canada. Compliance also comes at a very high price tag. It's going to cost me about $35,000 
between the city application fee, the survey work, and the consultants. So if we're being accused of stonewalling, if the staff is being accused of stonewalling, we all want to get this right. No one wants to get this wrong. I have been a resident here since 1970, when my dad came down from Thunder Bay and bought the Impala Motel at the corner of Stanley and Ferry, which has long since disappeared. We stayed there for a couple of years, moved up to Lundy's Lane where my father purchased the Sunny Home Motor Court and eventually over the course of six expansions turned out into a 64 unit motel. The first time I had interactions with some of the public officials was with Wayne came down to the Stanford High School parking lot when we were packing up our bags heading off to Windsor for the All-Ontario Basketball <coughs> Championship and he took the time out of his busy day to wish us the best of luck. This is actually we sold that business in 2000. I got involved with the online marketing, the reservation systems and ticketing technology, and I was one of the first guys who actually helped facilitate the success of all those bed and breakfast on River Road. Long before the giants of the booking.com and the Expedia's the Airbnb came place, I was actually giving those same B&Bs on that road their reservation system and ticketing technology. <coughs> That company still exists today. We provide a lot of jobs. We've sold our services to the likes of Ottawa Tourism, Vancouver Tourism, Victoria Tourism, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee. This is actually my fourth hotel project in the city, if I count with my parents. And we, see, we want this to be a success. It's, we're restoring a building which is architecturally significant. We're making it look better. And it is not a motel, according to this person's Know, disgraceful comments. Thank you for your time. Okay, any questions, questions? of council for, uh, yep, uh, yeah. Councilor Strange. Um, John, just want to know, like you've been open since? We've been open since 2014. The process of our expansion is we came down, I knew the previous owners of that property. They both tragically passed away in 2010 and 2011 from a 13 month time span from cancer. The property sat uh, vacant for a couple of years as the estate issues were being worked through. So we caught that, we bought that property in March of 2014. About May of 2014, we're able to buy the property right next door to the immediate <coughs> west at 4465 Eastwood Avenue. In 2015, we had purchased the property at 5401 River Road, which we call Niagara Gorge Road, which is just two doors north of Ken West Hughes. In 2016, we leased the property at 5395 River Road, which is currently owned by a longtime hotelier in the city, Lorenzo D'Amico. And then 2017 was a pivotal moment in the history of all this, is when we leased the property at 5411, which was directly adjacent to Ken Westwood, and that's when the explosion of emails started to all staff, planning department, and the complaints. Prior to that, he didn't care. <clears throat> Simple as that. There was no record, you won't find a record of one complaint to anybody, but that was the defining mark and it really suggests that he needs to have a zone around him in terms of, you know, he ha can't have any type of BMB beside him, any type of operation. So that's a little bit of our history. We currently lease two properties on John Street, which will be coming off lease as the Times Development Group is getting ready to start their condo development. So that's a bit of our history. So what was your question, I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, just another question is, is how, like, how many, would you say, rooms or people a year um, would you go through and like that, that you accommodate and do you, do you have any complaints from, from them? <laughs> Since 2014, we've processed about 11,000 plus room nights outside the main building. And to date, we have never had one bylaw officer from the city of Niagara show up in terms of a noise complaint, a garbage complaint. There's never been a police officer, Garbage's period, on peace. This is not a public meeting, folks, so please just uh, hold your decorum. We're going to have decorum here, and we have two speakers, and council will address it. Thank you. Continue. So we've never had any complaints. I'm sure the bylaw officer, he can tell you the same. They've never been to us in terms of a noise or party. We've, we manage the people as they come in. We manage them the next day. They're not coming to us to party when they know we have a 24-7 on-site presence in the main building. Any other questions of council? Is Councilor Campbell? Well, not necessarily. I'd like to uh, ask the uh, staff uh, strictly through the uh, solicitor. There seems to be some discrepancy here as to what is being called a bed and breakfast and what is being called a hotel. Can I have your legal opinion on this? 
Ms. Jock. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I'm happy to provide you a legal opinion, but probably not an open session, and uh, once I've had a chance to prepare one. Mr. CAO, could you maybe uh, weigh in? I, I think what um, the issue before us tonight is, um, we have Mr. West Hughes in front of us indicating that we should enforce the zoning bylaw. Um, what's happened, and we have uh, Mr. Pinter here, who now has said that he's into a process with our staff and probably will be in front of our council in the next several months with an actual rezoning application. So when the inn was rezoned, what happened subsequent to that was we got into a very large public process around this council table regarding vacation rentals. And many of Mr. Pinter's homes today would fall under that vacation rental designation. Uh, this council's bylaw has been appealed uh, that is going to be dealt with probably sometime early next year. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we have an, our enforcement staff going around to a number of other um, illegal uh, under the council zoning bylaw for vacation rental properties uh, enforcing the bylaw. Mr. Pinter several months ago came into our staff and indicated that he wanted to work in having compliance with those properties. That's the purpose of his zoning bylaw. Uh, he wants to uh, have a zoning amendment that would be specific to his property, that would see those satellite properties, um, for lack of better words, married with the host property, which is the, the inn, uh, and make it legal under zoning bylaws in effectively removing them from the connotation of a vacation rental. So you have a choice tonight. I think you either tell staff, um, regardless of that process that's going on, we'd like our bylaw staff to go out and, and immediately take action against Mr. Pinter's other satellite operations, or we allow Mr. Pinter time to go through the zoning process and finish that and attempt to get compliance with those properties. Either way, it's going to uh, cause a, um, in one respect, a, a, a zoning bylaw matter for our staff, which is fine. Um, our past practice has been, once we got somebody in the door and participating with us in a zoning amendment process, we've backed off the enforcement. Wow. That's been our past practice, that's what's happened here. Because technically, those other satellite homes did not become illegal until you passed your Airbnb by uh, about a year and a half ago. Yes, thank you. Councilor. Thank you, thank you uh, Ted. Mr. Todd, you know, I, I really have difficulty with this because we, pa we passed a bylaw that was to prevent this from continuing or to continue to happen in residential areas. How many more if we, we say tonight, we'll, we'll, we'll just put this on hold, how many more illegal operations are going to come before council and say, we've started a process and we're going to try to change the zoning from residential to whatever is necessary for us to continue to run the business? That's the problem I have with this. Well, I guess the answer is we're, we're you may get many. <coughs> and I can tell you our staff is prosecuting many. Oh, I know they are. There's, but, there's far too many of them. But you may get a number of those other ones that are operating now uh, that would come in and say, we're going we're gonna to hire professionals, we're going to get a zoning bylaw amendment going. Uh, whether we're right or wrong, and council can tell us tonight, our focus has been in, not that the people that have come in and are willing to work with us, our issues are with the people that keep uh, shoving it in our face and saying we're not going to comply. So um, well, that's kind of where I, we're I'm, so, I'm going to say right now, I'm not in favor of any residential areas being rezoned to, to allow this to happen. Wayne, can I say something? Certainly. Okay. 
the River Road Satellite District runs between, I believe, Queen Street, Alex can say, right down to Hiram. In that River Road Satellite District, I think it's been since the late 70s or the early 80s, been designated as a bed and breakfast district. But section 4.2.5 of the official plan also says, in regard to that River Road Satellite District, alternative forms of accommodation are permitted in that area as long as the residential character of the neighborhood is maintained. I don't think it's fair to turn around and say the River Road Satellite District is the exact same as Mount Carmel or is the exact same as Thundering Waters because you and your official plan said something totally different. So it's difficult to make that stretch and I totally understand what you're saying when you talk about these other residential areas in the city but if you're going to turn around and say well the River Road satellite district is a purely residential you've already got 45 b and b's you've got a number of licensed vacation rental operators in there these businesses are being sold in excess of a million dollars that's a commercial stink no matter how you try to spin on that I, I it's residential what you're saying mr pitcher but the reality is they are operating with legal licenses by the city of niagara falls and we're going to have one too not, not in a residential area but it's what it's not quite a residential well area. i'm sorry um, i don't know if anyone else is in agreement with me but i want to see the city of niagara falls starting to uh, uh use the bylaws the way they're supposed to be used and 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 have city staff go down and do the job that they're supposed to do I'm going to ask Garcia, what a <coughs> hey, Mr. Mayor, if, if that's the direction of council tonight, we'd be happy to do that, no question about it. But uh, what I want to indicate to council is that um, we are going to have, uh, right now our, our Airbnb vacation rental license is under appeal. We don't know if that's going to be successful or not. But there may be, now and in the future, individuals that come and want to apply to rezone their property. If they pay their fee and file the application with the planning department, we're compelled to run that process to its conclusion. Council may vote it down immediately, but they still have that opportunity to come in and ask for a rezoning on any property in the city, and that's under the Planning Act of Ontario. So um, they have to, be allowed the opportunity to go through that program. That's what Mr. Mr. Pinter is doing now. He's not quite there yet. He's not in front of this council yet so that you can make a decision on his properties. So in the meantime, we've got a decision to make. We can uh, accept the request of Mr. Westhuse, which says tomorrow our staff go out and uh, give orders to Mr. Pinter on the operation of those satellites or we say we're going to wait the two or three months to allow him to get in front of this council to apply for a rezoning where this council can then deal with it. And horse should buy a lot. You mean them, you shouldn't force them. Out you go. The difficulty is the bylaw is not in effect today. The Airbnb bylaw is not in effect, so what are we enforcing? That's the issue that we're faced with. The point is that there is a business operating in a residential area without the proper licensing. And there's probably 300 other ones that our staff are trying to deal with. But we with. know this one is operating. But the difference is, Councilor. No, there is no difference. There, there is it isn't before well, Councilor. The counselor. difference is, Councilor, our past practice has been when that individual walks through the door and is willing to work with our staff to go through a process to get compliance, that's what we do. And we have in the past backed off the enforcement to allow that process to carry out. If you're saying tonight, we don't want to carry out that practice anymore, we're quite happy to change, but that's what we've done in the past. He is not coming to us to get licensing for Airbnbs. He's coming to us to change the entire residential community along the river road there That's and you know it, it it started with uh, uh the, the museum the bird museum and then it's gone one step at a time and all that residential area people have purchased their homes in there for a specific reason it's a beautiful beautiful spot in niagara falls 
And if they want to come on an individual basis and get a license for an Airbnb and their, their accommodation, so be it. But this is an entirely different situation. Now, I make a motion that we, we direct staff to uh, uh, have the uh, bylaw enforcement officers attend tomorrow. Okay. We have a motion by Councillor Campbell. Do we have a second for the motion? Motion by Councillor Lococo. Do we have any discussion? Yes, uh, Councillor uh, Pierangelo and Cario. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, it's a difficult situation. I, I actually see both sides. I mean, I also believe that laws are laws and they're made to be upheld. Um, I also agree with Mr. Pinter when he says that, uh, you know, the River Road District is a little bit different. Uh, I think before I vote on it, I, I would like a couple of opinions. One would be of the planning staff of, you know, what they deem, you know, the River Road area to be. And I think that would really help me uh, in deciding because I also believe in what Mr. Todd is saying in terms of compliance. You know, oftentimes we have someone who, you know, um, they're not conforming to a bylaw and we try to work with them so that we try to get them to take the proper steps so that they are compliant to the bylaw. If that's the road that Mr. Pinter is going down and we see the River Road area as being a satellite district of tourism, something that could accommodate this type of uh, use, then, um, you know, really I, I have to ask myself what we're solving. The other opinion I'd like to see is not just from planning but also from our solicitor, Your Worship. Um, so those are my comments. Okay, Mr. Erlich. That would be before I vote on anything. Could you weigh in on this, uh, please, and uh, help us with the understanding of the, the area, how you would classify it? I'm going to take a, uh, a page out of the solicitor's notebook and say, I'll get back to you. We have an official plan that identifies certain uses for that River Road neighborhood. Some of them are just exactly the words that uh, Councillor Pietrangelo used, which was uh, a satellite area for tourism. Um, I'm not prepared to give you an off-the-cuff remark, and I don't think you would actually want me to give you an off-the-cuff remark. I think you want an informed and um, examined um, look at what the River Road area is. Um, I want to give you my professional opinion and not my personal opinion. Um, Councillor Peter Angel, did you have a follow-up to that? Um, kind of, Your Worship. I mean, I, I guess I would want to hear uh, the opinion of our director of planning and also of, uh, of our city solicitor before I would vote on anything. Um, I know that we're probably going to get applications such as these for people who want to uh, turn you know, residential homes into commercial operations. I really can't see this council being supportive unless the area itself is of a commercial nature. And that's really where my question is going. Um, I, I mean, if we believe that that district of town is going to be you know, in the future or is right now a satellite district of tourism, then I can see it going commercial. If we don't believe, then obviously we're not even going to consider an application. So, I mean, uh, maybe that's uh, putting the cart before the horse, but I, um, I'd, I'd like to see the opinions before I vote on it. So, if I can't get those opinions tonight, then I would just simply defer it until I can. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Carrier. Uh, thank you, Worship. My questions were along the same line as Councillor Peter Angel's, except one more. Has he applied? Has he applied yet? for rezoning, or has he made that an official application? No, we're about two weeks away, Vince. Yeah, we're waiting for the survey uh, work crews to finish their uh, work. As part of the application, we're mandated to have new surveys done for existing buildings. And it's been done, we're just waiting for the firm to produce that, and we'll be filing our application. And the only other the only other comment I would have it's going to make the application that's going to come before us whether or not it passes or not I don't know uh, but even if it passes the residents have the opportunity to take it to uh, uh, the new OMB and uh, I don't know what will happen then so what's the plan I mean how long do we do it it, it seems a little bit unfair so yeah. I'll get you let me just we'll get an answer here first so so uh, so just walk us through Mr. Hillovich so in a few weeks he applies and then it comes before this council eventually at some point, and then at that point, the public will have a chance to comment. And if it turns out that it's appealed, if this council approves, this council will either not approve it or approve it, 
and regardless it has an opportunity to go through an appeal process will that be with the LPAT uh, the, uh, is that how that would work yes uh, I, I'm kind of saying yes like that because some of what you've described is what we do some of it is because we have a pre-consultation meeting with uh, the various departments that hasn't occurred yet we've had a meeting with him at a staff level in the planning department so basically he's getting his application together we go through pre-consultation they'd have a chance to refine their application uh, once we receive that as a final applicant or complete application then we would circulate that to the various departments inside city hall and outside city hall um, once we get those comments uh, we would schedule that for a public or a, a neighborhood meet we'd have a neighborhood meeting uh, whether we schedule it for a public meeting under the Planning Act, usually that, and then we, so usually that's about four months from the time we get a complete application to the public meeting before council. We've already had our pre-con. Okay. Um, and there was no objections from any of the city departments. All right, so I stand corrected. We, we may be able to save one month. Um, I'd like to think that we will see that application by the end of September. We're at September the 10th now, says a couple of weeks. Um, given the council schedule, uh, we won't make the December meeting. Um, we might make January meeting. Um, and yes, depending on what council does, um, council may turn down the application uh, by Mr. Pinter, in which case he'll have an opportunity to appeal to LPAT. If council passes the uh, amendment application, then the residents could appeal to LPAT. And then we're probably into a year-long process. Okay, that's good. That's helpful, thank you. So I've got Councillor Campbell, then Lacoco. Well, I guess, and, uh, and I thank you, Mr. Hurlovich, for your, your comments. <coughs> but I know everyone sitting around the table realizes that if we turn down his application and staff has originally okayed the application, he can go to LPAT or whatever they're calling it today and 99.9% .9 of the time because city staff has okayed it, they're gonna stand behind his application. Am I correct? I would think that would more than likely be the case. I don't know about 99.9, .9, but. But it's pretty close. Mr. Elovich, you know a lot more than I do. Uh, right? So, what the councillor is saying is true. At this point, our staff haven't even analyzed the application. Well, he's come in and asked and talked to us. I can't say whether he's got staff support or not. And I'm saying right now that this has come before us. I firmly believe, based on the emails, the telephone calls that I've had from the residents in that community, they don't want it to happen. And that's why I made the motion that starting tomorrow, bylaw enforcement officers get into, pl into place. Well, Wayne, can I ask you something? What happens if I get 34 people to say the exact opposite? That they're happy they with it. There in that Absolutely. Because what you won't find. If you can direct your comments to the. Okay, through the sorry. Through well, what happens if I get 34 people to say the exact opposite? That they're happy with our operations there? You're taking the side, you're taking the people who've objected to this. And so far, the residents who've been happy, we provide a very cordial relationship with their immediate neighbors. I don't think you're going to find very many of them on that petition. Can I have see in the crowd how many people here tonight would support Mr. Pinter? Well, when we... Well, I'm just asking, no. Well, I, uh, well, I didn't bring a sure. crowd with me. That's I not a fair... The, I that. have the floor, and I think he was given five minutes. Yeah. Well, he's answering questions. He's answering yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, I have a motion, duly seconded. I would yeah. call the motion, please. Well, we still have Councilor Lacoco and Dabrowski on the list yet. So, Councilor Lacoco, you wanted to address this? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When vacation rentals first came into our community, I thought that there was a way that we could work with them and have, have them in our community. But our council came up with a solution that we were going to en enforce a bylaw. So they can only be in specific areas and that's what we have to go by. So as a counselor, I have to look at that. We all get phone calls, emails for all of the illegal Airbnbs constantly and we are enforcing those. 
So I sort of have a challenge with this. I'm sure you run a great business, and I'm sure your, your clients are very <coughs> grateful to you for that, but we do have a bylaw in place, and we are enforcing it with the Airbnb. Um, if we don't want to enforce this one, why, we, why are we enforcing the Airbnb bylaw? Something could happen in April. It, to, to me, it's either enforce it or don't. So I, I will support Councillor Campbell's motion to um, to not support this. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dabrowski. Uh, through you, the Mayor. Thanks for the, the presentation. I like consistency. I think uh, you run a legitimate business. You're not a young entrepreneur that's <coughs> investing in one, one property looking to make a quick buck. I think you've been running it since, since 2014. You bring 11,000 people into the city. I, I don't want to go uh, you know, against what Council said and uh, enforce, not say we, we enforce the bylaw right away, but I think um, this is a, a specific situation where your business is consistent with uh, with River Road and the River Road property. I don't see it as a neighborhood. I see I don't see it really as residential either. I think there's a lot of commercial businesses along River Ooh. Road. Oh wow! Read the Bible. Excuse me, folks. Excuse me. You are out of order. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, I, I look at this as a, a specific situation. I don't think it's an Airbnb discussion that we're having here. I think you're running. Uh, bed and breakfast and uh, I think it's consistent with uh, with the other businesses in the area so I, I can't support the motion at this time. Thank you. I've got uh, Councillor Thompson. Okay. Councillor Thompson? Yeah, I uh, have a question for the planner first of all. Um, when we were discussing the bylaw um, to regulate this, did we not look at River Road in a different way than the other, the rest of the community? Mr. Levich? Um, the, the bylaw that we brought before council was for the tourist commercial zones, the general commercial zones, and the downtown commercial zones. Um, neither of those, or none of those zones apply to River Road. So River Road wouldn't have been dealt with any differently than another uh, residential, residential area. Um, you know, and I know I said I would, I would rather prepare an opinion for you. The official plan designates River Road as residential, but we have within our tourist commercial policies, policies that say River Road is a satellite area to the tourist area, and it allows for bed and breakfast, so that doesn't exist well, I shouldn't say it, it now exists by virtue of the board decision. Um, so we do allow bed and breakfast in any residential designation now. Well, um, LPAS has made that decision. Yes, we don't have the written decision, but they've made, given a verbal verbal decision. Um, Anywhere it, in the city? Up to three <coughs> bedrooms. It, three bedrooms and you have to live yes. there. Um, the, the official plan also talks in terms of alternative forms of accommodation similar to a bed and breakfast. And then it does say, you know, elsewhere in the official plan that the satellite district, River Road Satellite District, shall function as a residential area with bed and breakfast permitted as long as the residential character is maintained. Mr. Pinter referred to that earlier. Uh, no commercial uses shall be permitted. So. Is he asking for a hotel to be permitted? I don't believe that's the request. A hotel would definitely be something we find in our TC, GC, CB zones. Um, not in a residential, that's not his ask. So until I actually see his application, I'd look at what the official plan says. You know, there's leeway in there. Um, how much weight do we put it, put in each direction? That all has to be assessed assessed on traffic volumes, what can be accommodated, and so on. That's where we get our circulation uh, comments. So. Anyway, this is a very difficult decision. Um, first of all, I re remember that property on the corner where they came in and asked for, because um, everybody could have three bedrooms for a bed and breakfast and they come in and they wanted to have six. And this council at the time uh, have approved six. And of course there's been uh, 
committee of adjustment uh, applications and approvals that have uh, created the property that uh, Mr. Uh, Pinter has on the corner there, uh, the uh, uh, main stay of your operation. Um, I thought that when we were looking at this, we were looking at uh, River Road as a different type of uh, zoning with respect. If you drive down there and uh, you're coming to buy a house for a single family residential home, uh, you gotta be next door to a bed and breakfast. Mm -hmm. And I get um, six or eight calls every weekend and I've been leading the charge hopefully against Airbnbs in single family residential areas. And uh, I have the, the problem is you got uh, um, uh, something that's uh, Airbnb in a residential area and you get a call at uh, 11 o'clock at night and they said there's 25 guys out from Toronto having a stag in the backyard drinking and music and carrying on and I'm trying to put my kids to bed. I don't want to see that. That's unacceptable. And I have to say, without exception, I have never had a call, uh, a complaint, for a bed and breakfast in the River Road area. It uh, just doesn't happen, probably because the people are living there and they <coughs> control uh, three bedrooms and uh, don't cause a problem with uh, backyard parties and uh, too many people there. So uh, this whole thing is uh, gonna come back in April for a final decision by LPAT. So uh, that's gonna have, uh, we're gonna have to do a lot of thinking and a lot of work to determine uh, what is gonna happen with River Road. River Road, in my opinion, is not uh, a typical uh, single family residential area. And that's why Mr. Pinter is in the business that he's in. Uh, maybe uh, in the meantime, you have to have uh, somebody living there. And we do. Carry on your operations. Well, we do have a full time 24 7 presence. Pardon me? We do have a full time innkeeper. Is a 24 7 presence there? Uh, no, I, in your single... Oh, I see what you're saying, okay. Yeah, I said if you had somebody then, you would comply right. with the bylaw. So you wouldn't have to have a rezone. Anyway, this is going to be a very difficult decision, and I don't think it's going to be solved until LPAT comes down with their decision mm -hmm. with respect to uh, Airbnbs. Hopefully they don't... Uh, expand that through the whole city because that's where your problems and constant complaints come from. So uh, I think we have to have a uh, serious discussion and debate and input from everybody on River Road to make a final decision with respect to this. It's not going to be <coughs> easy. Thank you. Councilor Kennedy. <coughs> Yes, uh, just response, uh, and I appreciate your comments, uh, Councillor Thompson. And if indeed uh, these were legal operating bed and breakfasts, I don't think anybody would have a problem with this. The problem is it's an illegal operation. They are not legally bed and breakfasts. To your comment, Councillor Dabrowski. You said you couldn't support. You had an idea that they were operating. They're not operating legally. That's the problem. And are we going to deal with the reality of today, or are we going to deal with the what ifs of tomorrow? The what ifs of tomorrow could go on for years, and this operation can continue to be an illegal operation. So. Are we going to stand by our bylaws or are we not going to stand by our bylaws? I do uh, ask our, our solicitor for one point of clarification if you could help me understand something. Um, as Councillor Campbell mentions, we have a bylaw. 
but the bylaw, as I understand it, has been repealed by the LPAT in this chamber. Uh, we've received verbal notice, Mr. Ilovich, not written notice of the repealing of that bylaw. So what status does that leave these B&Bs on River Road right now with regard to contravention of our bylaw? I don't know if between the two of you, can you can even answer that or, or if you need to get back. And if that's fair, if you can't answer it on your feet, I'm fine with that too. But I don't know if you wanted to, to address that if you can. River Road between the uh, between River Road and the Olympic Torch Trail from I think John Street up to about Morrison Street is zoned R2-2. The dash two allows bed and breakfast. <coughs> so the bylaw that's under appeal or whatever really doesn't apply. They can have uh, bed and breakfast operations there. They have to come in and get a license and live there. Okay. All right, are there any other questions or comments of council? Yes, Councilor Kerry. Uh, it is a, a, a tough situation, but we can't do nothing. Uh, if he had his application in now, I would feel a little bit different. He doesn't have the application in as of yet. So we should, if this motion fails, we should do something and say, if he gets his application in, we'll give him a certain amount of time to get his application in. If he doesn't get his application in by that time, I agree with Councillor Campbell that we have to do the same thing that we're doing with other neighborhoods. The people that live there are in the same position as someone else. Technically, he's running an operation that doesn't meet the bylaw. The same as someone calls us on any other street complaining about an Airbnb. If, it was, if his application was in, uh, I would be prepared to give him a few months to get it together to see what happens. But in, I, I think we have to do something, give him a deadline or whatever, and if he doesn't get his application in by then, we send the bylaw people and treat it the same way as any other situation. Any other questions or comments of council? Are you asking for a friendly amendment? No, he's saying if it fails, he's not saying, he's saying if it, to do something. So we have a motion. Uh, by, by, do you want to repeat your motion, I, Councilor Kim? My motion is that we, we enforce the bylaw. Okay, and you've heard the motion uh, by Councilor Campbell, seconded by Councilor Lococo. So we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, so that motion fails. Is there another motion that you'd like to place? Councilor Carrier? I would make the motion that we give them, we pick a date and he's got that amount of time to get his application in and start the process officially. And after that period of time, whether it's the end of September or whatever Mr. Pinter says he needs, uh, that's reasonable. Yes. Then other than that, after that date, we, uh, we, we treat him the same way as any other illegal. Uh, Mr. Mr. CAO is gonna weigh in. I just make a suggestion. Um, next council meeting's October 1st. Perhaps I could suggest we have Mr. Pinter have the application in prior to that meeting. And uh, if not, we'll be back here on October 1st seeking further and council direction. If he doesn't have his application in by October 1st, then we proceed to treat him the same way as we treat all the other. Okay. Uh, motion by Councilor Cario, second by Councilor Dabrowski. Any other comments or questions to the motion? Okay. Seeing none, let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. Opposed? Okay. And that passes. So the outcome of tonight is you have to get your application in by the next council meeting, October the 1st. And that shouldn't be a problem whatsoever. We're ready to go. Okay. That's good because if not that night, we'll have a different discussion. So. No, and it'll okay. be a very good application too. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Westhues. Thank you, Mr. Pinter. Thank you to everyone else that showed time to be here tonight. Thank you. And now we're gonna move on to the planning portion of our council agenda tonight. And since there's nothing in planning, we're going to go right to reports and presentations. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to give uh, these folks a couple minutes to vacate. Okay, yeah, right, I got gotcha. you. Okay, so 
Council, uh, item 8.9, PBD 2019-42. We have, it's a telecommunication facility consultation, and there's a recommendation currently before you uh, regarding putting in a cell tower in our business park. Uh, Councilor Strange. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, we've all, as council received um, emails, phone calls from both parties on these different towers and um, very respected locations, um, very respected companies that want to come in and uh, have these towers. Basically, they were saying that we're allowed to um, recommend one, but we're not actually the body that actually decides uh, who decides which tower. They're both um, uh, great uh, uh, applications, and I and I think probably all council would, would agree with me is that we just uh, put forward both of them, and um, it would be great if both of them got approved. But if, in the end, it's not up to us. We don't want to hash it out and people up here yelling at each other. We would rather just put it through and uh, let the uh, deciding board um, decide whether each one they want, none of them, or both. If I, I would like to push that motion on the floor. Okay, we have a motion by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, that both locations get forwarded to the or the federal uh, regulator to make the final decision. As the decision doesn't rest with us as it is, regardless, it rests with the federal body. Do we have questions or comments to that motion? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Okay, so thanks very much, gentlemen. So we'll move on to item 8.2, City of Niagara Falls Sanitary Sewer Network Condition Assessment. And who's gonna make the presentation? Oh, Kent? Kent's doing an intro. Oh, I didn't see it there, okay, I'm sorry. So Kent? Yeah, so I was just gonna do a brief introduction. And okay. Okay, the, um, the purpose is of your the microphone report. on? Is your microphone on? Yes, the red, yes, little red buttons on? Yes, it is. Okay, good. Uh, the technical people were holding their hand. I wasn't sure if they could hear you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, I'll try and speak up then. Um, the uh, purpose of the uh, um, uh, presentation and the report is uh, to provide an update to uh, council on uh, a couple of concurrent projects that uh, or programs that the uh, Works Department has underway at the moment. Uh, one is the, uh, the citywide uh, sanitary sewer system uh, network condition assessment program, and uh, the uh, second is the uh, South Niagara Falls infiltration in, in, in full study. Um, both of these uh, came out of recommendations from the uh, pollution control plan study that was uh, presented and adopted in 2017. Um, the, uh, specifically, the network condition assessment program is a three year program where we will inspect rate the uh, condition and the operational efficiency of the entire sanitary sewer network, which is all of the pipes and manholes within the city. Um, that program started in 2018. Um, uh, GM Blue Plan Engineering, uh, this consultant firm that was uh, asked to uh, develop the program with us, and they are assisting with the administration of the contract, which was awarded to Pipe Tech Infrastructure Services. That contract's been underway since uh, the fall of 2018. They have completed what we call year one, which is basically a third of the city, and they've been concentrating all their efforts as part of year one in the uh, southern half of the city. So that's all the sewers uh, south of Lundy's Lane, essentially, which is uh, coincidentally also the uh, area of focus for the infiltration and infill study. Where there we were here uh, doing uh, various investigations and tests, including things like flow monitoring to determine, locate, and determine the uh, sources of the extraneous flow, which are the infiltration and inflow into our sewer network. Um, and then what will happen following that is um, uh, GM Blue Plan will be providing recommendations to us on uh, the outcome of these, uh, both these programs uh, to uh, uh, do remedial actions to deal with <coughs> infiltration and inflow and to uh, repair the sewers in, uh, in that portion. And those programs will be coming forward uh, as part of the uh, Budget asking. <coughs> so, uh, Danielle Anders from GM Blue Plan is going to provide a detailed uh, presentation. All right, Ms. Sanders, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. As uh, Kent noted, uh, I'm a uh, 
partner with GM Blue Plan Engineering, and I've been working with the city um, for several uh, months, actually since last year, on the Sanitary Sewer Network Condition Assessment Program, as well as some uh, influent infiltration studies that are occurring in the southern part of the city. So tonight's presentation is to provide information to council concerning the status and the progress of those programs, the, um, the INI studies, as well as the uh, Sanitary Sewer Network Condition Assessment Program, which is still underway. Um, so there's no final recommendations, it's just to provide some update to council as GM Blue Plan will be working with the city, uh, city staff going forward now as we're moving towards some 2020 budgetary uh, recommendations for some of the information coming out of this program. So you'll hear about it again, so we just wanted to come and provide some information on the status. So as Kent uh, noted, uh, there's three main players uh, for this uh, network condition assessment program, which uh, is a CCTV program of your entire sanitary sewer network. The City of Niagara Falls staff, who are the, you guys are the contract owners. Um, GM Blue Pen Engineering, we're doing all the contract administration with the contractor and all the QA, QC, and we're reviewing all the data and providing recommendations back concerning uh, next steps, rehabilitation, replacement programs on your sanitary sewer system. Pipe Tech is the contractor that was retained, um, and they have completed year one of the program. They're just working into the year two areas. So I'm gonna provide an overview of the year one tonight. So just to um, review the key pieces here, which is the program objectives. So the whole point of this program is to get a baseline understanding of the structural and operating condition of your entire sanitary sewer network. And as Kent mentioned, that was a recommendation coming mm -hmm. out of the Pollution Prevention Control Update. And the information coming out of this program in consolidation and coordination with the INI studies that are ongoing will provide a basis for remediation and rehab of your sanitary system, will provide a basis for ongoing maintenance programs, which will provide some additional work and um, information for your maintenance and operating uh, group uh, to work on the sanitary system and provide continuous improvement of your sanitary network. So the program um, is really aimed at uh, targeting wet weather, and that's why we're talking about uh, the CCTV work in conjunction with the INI studies, because we're looking to get those uh, infiltration items out of your system, and this information will help us find where those things are. Um, it's insured, uh, we want to ensure good state of good repair of your sanitary sewer system. Um, we want to find those system bottlenecks through this program so we can remove them which will in turn free up some development capacity and then increase your resiliency against basement flooding. So key program drivers, at the beginning of this program, uh, we sat down with city staff to um, determine what the key program drivers are in order to prioritize. We're doing your entire system over three years, so we had to come up with uh, which third we're gonna start in and what are the program priorities and drivers. So what came to the top of the pile was the II reduction south of Lundy's Lane. As I'm sure council is aware, um, the region is currently underway with an EA for a new south wastewater treatment plant. Um, in the south side, um, we rated Chippewa as the highest priority because as council is aware, there's been uh, significant II uh, studies and work being done there over the last several years. And then the remaining uh, areas of the south side with high II. So that's where we focused the year one efforts. Second driver for the program was the II reduction citywide, which was to look at the peat flow reduction for the year two and year three areas, which I'll talk about. And then in general, one of the overarching sort of overall state of good repair of the system is a, is a key program driver for us to really have a good understanding of the structural and operating condition of your system so that we can then improve upon that. So I wanted to put a slide in here um, just so council is aware of all the work that uh, has been going on. Uh, south of Lundy's Lane in conjunction with this uh, overarching CCTV program. So significant work has been completed in south of Lundy's Lane, including uh, Chippewa, and each piece has been building on previous work to really drill down to find and eliminate II. So um, DM Blue Pen has been involved in all these programs. I have been involved in all these programs. Uh, Cattell Hydraulic Analysis, a DM Blue Pen worked with city staff to look at uh, could tell the hydraulic analysis of that sewer as well as your new Riverview tank and look at the emergency pumping operations that have occurred over the past in Chippewa to try and optimize that process and understand what's going on in that system. So that, pro that little assignment is done and uh, we're happy to say your Riverview tank and your system out there is working better than it has uh, certainly 10 years ago, so that's good news. 
uh, Gunning Amir's Pump Station, which is a storm pump station. I believe it's the only pump station the city of Niagara Falls owns and operates. That is also located in Chippewa. Um, and it was recognized several years ago that that needed some um, attention and improvements. So we have been working on that and that is going to tender um, basically soon. It's going to tender in fall of 2019. We're just waiting on the final ECA approval on that one. Um, Kent touched on Chippewa flow monitoring. So there's II study going on south of Lundy's Lane. Last year, we did extensive flow monitoring in the Chippewa area to identify and rank uh, all the, we split Chippewa into a bunch of catchments and we wanted to find out uh, where the high II areas are so we can then drill down further into field investigation. Uh, flow monitoring was done last year. Field investigation is currently going on now. The CCTV program, which I'm gonna talk more about tonight, the year one areas for that uh, provides us critical information to augment all this other work. And there is also for the remaining areas in the south side, flow monitoring that occurred last year and is currently going on this year as well to, to augment all this information. So this, just for your information, we talk about the year one area and it's areas south of Lundy's Lane. Kind of hard to see up on your screen there, but uh, it is essentially all the areas south of Lundy's Lane, including Chippewa. The only piece that's south of Lundy's Lane that is excluded is the subdivision, actually where I currently reside, which is at Kaler and McLeod Road. That um, was a little bit out of the quantities for year one, so that was where the contractor started year two. So currently that's actually already been completed. Tonight we're just going to talk about the year one results. So um, year one results. So these are some pipe inspection results. Uh, what's going on here is, um, I'm sure everyone's heard about CCTV before, but just for a quick, quick refresher, um, CCTV is, uh, camera goes down the pipe and the contractor is responsible for um, coding any defect they see according to a NASCO standard, five being bad and um, in need of immediate attention, all the way back down to a one, which is something that's, there's something there, but you know, can be passed along and looked at in future uh, inspections. So I suppose this is a bit of a good news story here. Um, we split everything out by structural condition and operating condition, the defects come out that way. So under structural condition, you would have things like holes, um, conveyance issues, sags in your pipe, deformities, uh, that would fall under structural. Under operating is mostly debris, <coughs> grease, those sorts of um, things that would up roots would um, affect the operating condition. So um, if we look at year one CCTV of your pipes on the structural condition, only about 19 to 20% fell in the four and five category, which is the, the sort of the, the very bad we need to look at it now category. And on the operating side, even less. So um, on the structural side, 38% fell under a three, which are those defects that aren't quite in the look at them now pile, but we look at these maybe in, in another couple of years because they're kind of getting there. So I think um, for the age of your system, I think, and the age of the, the sanitary sewer network in South of Lundy's Lane in some of those areas, I think this, this is the result and this is uh, a bit of a good news story. Just to provide a quick overview on a map, it's kind of hard to see on your screen. We combine the operating and the structural condition to color code each pipe, red being um, a pipe in poor condition that needs looking at, all the way back down to green as well. So you can kind of see um, some pockets there. So Chippewa's got quite a bit of yellow, um, a little bit of red and some orange. You've got a huge chunk of green on the other side of the canal, and then you've got some more pockets with quite a bit of yellow um, up there closer to Lundy's Lane. We pulled out infiltration defects and we pulled out structural defects greater than four. For this map, uh, yellow dots are structural defects, uh, large, uh, sorry, yellow dots are infiltration. So the larger the dot, the larger the leak, basically. So you can kind of see some um, pockets of infiltration there across your system as well. The green triangles are structural defects, only, great, only four and up. So that's your bad structural defect. Anything less than that, we didn't put on this map. They're kind of sporadically spread around, but you do have uh, some pockets of those as well. So I pulled a few pictures just to show council some um, of what we're talking about here. You know, real pictures of your sanitary sewer network. And these are sewers that fell under those categories of four and five. So some of the, you know, more unfortunate looking sewers. And really I wanted to kind of stress that this is, these pictures might look kind of scary, but um, these, are re these are really reasons that support this program. Because now we know where these things are before that first pipe collapses or before that other pipe collapses. So now we really know, we have a good idea of uh, what's going on in your system before you have 
a, a major, a more major issue, like a collapse or a backup or anything like that. So the first pipe there, the pipe that I'm looking at on the left, that's got, uh, that's a very poor condition pipe due to the cracking. And that pipe looks like it's starting to lose its uh, ovality and it's starting to kind of um, not be so round anymore. So that's uh, usually a sign of an imminent collapse. The one beside it has quite a few cracks in it as well, but also has a lot of debris in it. So we're looking at both things here, right? Um, structural things, and I'm gonna talk about how we would rehab those, and then um, operational things like debris. There's a couple more. Um, the one on the left is a big hole and some cracking, and the one on the right is debris. That's actually, you can see some roots at the top of that one, but that's actually what we would call a fat berg. So that's fat soils and greases attached with other stuff. So, um, and these are the sort of things that, uh, that now we know, we know where they are before, before it turns into a, like a bigger emergency, right? So these are really reasons that support the program. So included in this program, as well as doing CCTV of all your sewers, we are also scanning every manhole in the city. Um, it made sense. The contractor's out there already. He has the technology. It's a different uh, camera, actually. Um, it's a panoramic camera, and it scans a 360 of every single manhole in the city. So these are just some quick numbers. 1,452 unique manholes were scanned to date for the year one areas. 566 of those had at least one infiltration defect. Uh, only 32 had issues. Uh, structural issues on them rated at fours, and you had 46 that had structural issues on them rated at fives. So there's a bit of a difference here in the data uh, for manholes, because they're a little different. They operate a little differently than pipes. Um, so you've got some structural condition issues, but the majority from that are green. So the majority of manholes are in, in pretty good condition structurally. And operating, operating as I said, is mostly debris and, and stuff like that. So on a manhole, it's a little different than a pipe. So most of your manholes operationally are all in the green category. So um, that's a good news story there as well. And this is an overview map. We combine those two structural and operating grades together and um, color code them. So red are manholes that uh, likely have some sort of structural, con uh, structural defect on them that we'll look at. And we'll, we're gonna wrap those in with the pipes when we do the rehab. Um, and then write down yellow, the same color coding as before, orange, yellow, and green. So we're gonna take all that data and we're gonna work with city staff to put together a remediation and, and or replacement plan. And that's some of the discussions that are going on right now because we have the information from year one and you're entering a, um, some planning work now for your 2020 budget. So we've looked at the methodology and how we're going to do this and our remediation plan is gonna focus on info and infiltration because we wanna improve your level of service. We wanna reduce those extraneous flows because we know those have been an issue here in your system. We want to remove any conveyance restrictions, as now we know where they are. And then we want to have that opportunity to, as well as deal with infiltration, I and I defects, we want that opportunity to repair other defects while we're there as well. So to do that, we're going to have a big long list of pipes that came out of all those numbers I just showed you. So we have to pal uh, prioritize them in some way. So we want to balance the improvement objectives and the rehab methodology. So it depends what kind of defects are on the pipes depending, that kind of sets what kind of re rehab methodology we're gonna use. We're gonna look at improvement and objectives, constraints, budget being one of the constraints. Not every municipality, you're gonna have a big long list, you're not gonna fix them all in the first year. And then available resources to get that work out, which we have to consider as well here at the city. So this is a quick overview of our action plan. And then after this slide, I'm gonna get into a little bit more details of what we've done in the I, &I studies, because this slide kind of starts to bring everything together. So our action plan, which was presented to city staff, is um, one through six. So one through three, we would call quick wins. So as the contractor's been moving through your system and they see something that they think needs immediate attention, we have it set up so they email, they have a special email address that they email staff here at the city and copy GM blue plan. So we have a bit of a running list of what we, we kind of call emergency repairs. So we suggest, there's about 35 issues on that list. The city's been working through it. I think they fixed about five or six since the last time I got an update. So we suggest dealing with those first, get those sort of off the list. The next two items are issues that are um, items that have come out of our I and I program in uh, the Chippewa area, which is manhole inserts. Um, and I'll show a slide on this in a moment. But there are some uh, sewers, uh, mainly on Cattell, that have manholes in the gutter. So um, when we talk about manhole inserts, there are inserts that go in a manhole. So that what's happening, I think, on that sewer is the water is sitting on top of manholes um, and not getting into catch basins. So you're getting extra water in your system. 
Uh, catch basins, there's some catch basins that we found in Chippewa that through smoke testing were smoking when we were smoking the sanitary system, so they're connected to the sanitary system somehow. Um, so those, removing those from the connections would be a quick way to get some immediate I and I out of your system. And after that, we're recommending going through, we're gonna be going through all of this year one CCTV program data, um, looking at the types of defects and how many of them are on pipes, the severity and the extent of those defects. We're gonna be taking your water main break and road condition information, overlaying all that together to get a prioritized list. So things that fall within uh, already planned capital or pipes that fall within roads that are already planned for resurfacing, those would come to the top of the list. And all of that information is going to feed into things you're going to see further down the road when uh, when staff comes back to you about budgets, which is a multi-year spot repair and rehab program, which is going to be a result of this, a multi-year remedial action program on your sanitary system, as well as this program will not only be recommending rehab, but we were recommending some sanitary sewer replacement. So that'll be coming forward. You'll see that again um, through the budget cycle on that. Operationally, um, there's going to be a bunch of information we're going to be providing to your operations and maintenance group um, say on the sanitary side to uh, work through. So flushing, cleaning, because now we've got some pockets we've seen in the system they might not have been aware of before. And then the last item there is just to get our contractor to do some uh, TVing of your sewer when it's actually raining on some of the pipes we think have bad I and I on them and see what's actually happening during a rainstorm. So just to touch on this again, uh, rehab, so one of the quick win items is to do some manhole inserts, 29 manholes in uh, the road and about 20 or 30 in low lying grassed areas that could use an insert just to prevent extra water getting into your system. Currently in talks with the city staff on a good product for this, we're trying to work out, I actually have a manhole insert sitting in my office right now because we're working through um, rec recommending a product that's gonna, that's gonna work for the city for this item. And it's 12,000 bucks, it's a, it's a low cost item. And um, this is a quick map with the blue dots to show you sort of where those are in Chippewa. Most of them are along Kittel, um, Usher Chipman up in that area. Smoke testing, so we did the flow monitoring in Chippewa last year. We identified a whole bunch of uh, sections that have poor I and I based on the, uh, have a lot of I and I inflow based on the flow monitoring results. So we've been back in there this year doing um, some smoke testing. Um, and smoke testing reveals, uh, we smoke test everything, we smoke the sanitary sewer and see what happens. So we've got uh, municipal sources and private property sources of II, all that's been recorded, but the focus here really is the municipal sources of II. And we found eight catch basins that potentially are connected to sanitary. So we're currently doing investigation, dye testing, further investigation to see how those are connected and how we can remove them from the system. Couple more slides. Uh, remediation plan development. So, really, the complexity of the rehab depends on what kind of defects are on the pipes. That's basically what this shows. Um, capacity issues, collapses, deformities are harder to deal with. Some of those have to be replacements, all the way down to uh, O&M deficiencies, which can be done through uh, maintenance and cleaning programs. Just to touch on the maintenance. So, um, we're going to be, as I said, providing uh, your uh, group uh, operations a list of areas that had some. Um, dirty sewers so they can stay on top of that now. Um, I should note um, through this program we've been doing CCTV so pre that everything is flushed before we CCTV it so all those sewers in the year one area are probably the cleanest they've been in a long time because we've had to do that to get the good uh, camera so your system is through this program is even getting a little bit of a, a bit of a refresher and a cleanup as well. Um, so root intrusions, grease, all those things um, will be city-led programs unless there's some specialized or some, some specialized contractors to deal with some of the more hard to deal with cleaning roots, that sort of stuff. So that is um, sort of the two sides of the program. That's all I have. Um, any questions? I'll be willing to answer any questions. There's a lot of there's a lot going on in those programs that tried to condense it, so there's a lot of information there to digest. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Any questions of council? Councillor Lacoco. Through the mayor to the presenter, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm really happy that we're doing something like this to find out where exactly we are, and especially in our Chippewa area. We've always had a lot of complaints about the, the flushing and the toilet system and the sewer system. So thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, yes, Councillor Pierangelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, 
guess I just want to say I I know the information isn't the most exciting information to get a presentation. We could have changed gears. <laughs> but but I honestly believe that this is some of the best money that we've spent in years. I mean, getting a baseline on our system. If we think about how we've been operating up until this point, we've been reactionary every time something <coughs> happens. That's when we react. Having a baseline of your system and knowing where your problem areas are, where your areas are that you need to fix, in my opinion, is getting ahead of the curve. So this is some of the best money that we've ever spent. Um, and it's gonna help us in the future. I know you talked about Chippewa as well. I know we've made uh, upgrades to the low lift pumping station there. I know we put the holding tanks in as well as the other improvements that you've mentioned. And as well, the South End sewage treatment plant is on its way. And there was an article in the paper this weekend. So. Your Worship, to me this is exciting because I've always wanted to end basement flooding and having a baseline of our sewage system is just going to help us in that regard. That's great. Any other questions or comments? So I've got two quick ones for you. Um, sure. You mentioned that some of the catch basins were somehow connected to the sanitary sewers. So in your past experience, how does that happen? Um, we suspect that they're, we've die tested some of them and they're not clear connections, but they smoked. So there's a connection somewhere. We suspect there's some sort of overflow someone has put in along the way for some sort of purpose. It just depends. It's just, the Chippewa system's an older system. I think some of the pipes are, you know, uh, pre-1960, so there was some reason that those things were put in, but it looks like those are probably not direct connection, but some sort of overflows as well. Yeah, so like grandpa was out there putting in his own pipes kind uh, of thing. Or city staff, or there was some reason at the time, but, uh, and there's not, it's not the whole street, it's only a select number yeah. of catch basins that smoked. So we're, we're committed to trying to figure out how they're connected, because they smoke. So there is a sanitary, you know, when we smoke the sanitary and smoke's coming out, something that's not supposed to be sanitary, there is a connection there, because the smoke kind of gets wherever, but um, we're gonna, we're committed, and we're committed to, You'll probably see me again talking about Chippewa a little bit more, but we are committed to helping solve that I&I &I problem out in Chippewa. So two other quick questions. One is, I know in the past we've had some problems with fog in our sewers, mm -hmm. fat soils and mm -hmm. greases, and I just wondered the, what you've seen. Did you see any areas that were prone to it or that we had uh, worse areas than others? So there were some areas. I don't know them off the top of my head. I'd have to pull the data and make a, like a map, um, and that could be provided to staff. That's I could have been, I guess I could have included it in this presentation, but but there is. So um, when this the contractor um, part of his uh, base contract was they flushed twice, then the CCTV. But in some areas they um, two two passes with the flusher was not enough. So some of that stuff was put onto a, um, an hourly cleaning list and then they would deal with city staff on, okay, these are areas that need extra cleaning. Um, so there are some pockets that we could pull the data and make a map and show you, but there were some, yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't good. know them off the top of my head, but there, are some, there were some that were dirtier, some were more dirty with sediment, some were a little bit more dirty with uh, fat soils and greases, but for sure. The other thing we're hearing more and more about are these um, flushable wipes mm -hmm. causing some problems in sanitary systems. Yep. I wondered if you, if, did anything jump out in that regard too that you recall? Uh, not that I recall, but I haven't looked at all the videos, but that, that picture that I showed, that it looks like fat soils and greases, they call it a fat burr, with other things like wipes. That's what happens, right? They, it kind of all congeals together and then you get blockages like that. I don't recall any um, of the emergency repairs coming through that were related to wipes, but, um, but it is, I was at a, a WEAO meeting this morning, we were talking about the same topic, so. And, and the last question, um, your opinion on repairs that, you know, the ones that you can actually uh, dig it out and put in yep. the pipes versus the, you know, the, uh, that new system where they reline the pipe from the yep. inside. Have you had much experience utilizing those types of repairs? Yes, so um, we're gonna be recommending um, all three of those options, depending on what okay. kind of defects are on the pipes. Right. So we will be recommending a trenchless relining program here. Um, it's great bang for your buck. It, they are structural, you know, we'll be re recommending a structural lining product that would give you that structural consistency back to your um, stability back to your sewers, but it depends on what um, what else is going on on those sewers. We also have to consider um, if some of those sewers that are in poor condition, like that one that was really cracked, is actually past its service life, um, then you might want to replace it. And all those other things that are going on around it. If you've just redone the road, then we probably would want to go for a trenchless application. But we will see that as three separate programs. And spot repairs will also be a program we will recommend as well. Because sometimes it's just you've got one defect in the middle of a pipe that really needs looking at, well, we're not going to replace the whole pipe. We're going to spot repair it. And and trenchless rehab is done uh, in a lot of municipalities, but I don't think Niagara's really done 
a ton of it over the years, so this will be a good opportunity, and we're gonna, you have enough quantity here to probably put out a good contract for that. Okay, so you'll see those recommendations in the future coming out of this one, so. Well, that's yeah. great. Well, if we have no uh, further questions or comments, then uh, Council, we've got a report with two recommendations, one that we receive, and two, that staff be directed to integrate the year one rehabilitation plan recommendations into the Municipal Works Department priorities, including future capital and operating budgets. So we need someone to make the motion. Uh, moved by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Sanders. Okay, moving along to item 8.3, civil marriage ceremonies. Uh, we have a recommendation here, two parts. One, that council reconsidered its decision of October 18th to not offer civil marriage services. Do we need a, a vote for that? Or that was the last council, so we don't need to, do we? Reconsider? Uh, yeah, so it, it's not really considered a reconsideration oh. as per the procedural I bylaw. Okay. You're right, it's actually four terms of council ago. Yeah, you wouldn't get a majority. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what we're looking for is to authorize the clerk or delegated staff to author be authorized to perform civil marriage cer ceremonies and say, Moved by Councillor Thompson. <laughs> yes, and uh, who's going to be in charge of divorce? <laughs> you can't, you have your hand up. Did you need something? You couldn't hear. Are your mics on, guys? Are your mics on? I didn't speak. Okay. I'm just asking. I'm not going to So we got a motion by uh, Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. He just wanted to know, Councillor Thompson wanted to know who's going to be in charge of uh, presiding over divorces. Uh, that was his concern. So we'll leave that for the clerk to do a follow-up report. So we've got the recommendation moved and seconded. If there's no questions or comments, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Wouldn't that be nice? You could marry Councillor Strange. Wouldn't that be nice, that right? Would, that would be amazing. <laughs> that would, that'd be great. That's what I heard. Okay. <laughs> item <challenge. laughs> item 8.4 um, fee waiver applications for livestock Niagara Music and Arts Festival there are two recommendations are you making the motion counselor counselor Peter Angelo second by counselor strange uh, that we support the bow wow chow uh, festival uh, all those in favor okay and that's approved thank you item 8.5 Rapids View Drive and Bucator Drive project update uh, two recommendations that we receive the report, and secondly, that additional funds of $128,000 be allocated for the sewer separation project. So okay, moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Thompson. Are you in favor? Um, yes, I am, but okay. I, I think uh, uh, I brought this to the attention of the CAO a few <coughs> weeks ago as I was approached by the property that's affected by this yeah and uh, I was surprised to see this come in and uh, maybe you could just briefly say that we're re rectifying the sewer system in the area remove it from private property or cut it off or whatever so I know exactly what's going on here and, and that's exactly the project this is um, it runs over the former uh, hotel property but it takes a complete redesign of the whole area to, to correct the sewer system. That's why there's additional design money asked for tonight. Um, that design work has to be done. Uh, it's going to take several, several months more to finish that before we can then get the capital project on the list here for council. So it's important that this uh, additional money gets the engineering work completed. Did you make the motion? I'll second. Okay, so we'll do it that way. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Uh, item 8.6, now we do have a request to speak. Uh, there are two recommendations. First, that the council receive and file the resident comments petition attached to the report. And secondly, the council award the contract for construction of the sidewalk on Parkway Drive to Sacco Construction, limited the amount of 203850 so we do have a request to speak by Deborah Willick. Deborah, if you'd like to come to the microphone. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. So I'm assuming everybody's read everybody's comments. Okay. I'm quite surprised that you've already decided. 
like it's already been awarded to cycle construction like everything we've said doesn't even matter I no, guess. it hasn't been awarded yet not till we well, that's vote. what it says <laughs> no that's the recommendation but okay. it hasn't been approved yet okay well for one thing if you put it on okay our street is a very quiet street we haven't needed sidewalks for 40 years we have one kid that gets driven to school the other one's 12 years old he's going to high school next year um, the sidewalk proposal that you put it on you put it on the wrong side you've got it on the side that you've got across from Callan Street to Cattell four streets you have to cross four streets to get there instead of crossing the other side would be two streets and the other side also has street lights I live on the corner of Parkway and Bredner and when the snowplow comes around I get like two to three feet high on my curbs like it's gonna go right over top of this sidewalk and I don't know if I'm supposed to be the one that cleans it Nick Golia made it sound like we don't have to do our sidewalks is that true is there a bylaw saying that we don't have to shovel our sidewalks? No, there's no bylaw that you have to do sidewalks, but certain sidewalks, about a third of them in the city, are sidewalk plowed by the by the city. Well, I don't he know told us that thing. wouldn't be plowed anyways. Yeah. Even though we're close to a school. Mind you, there's another street, Furlong Avenue, that wasn't even put on that map. They made the school, Riverview School picture, so big that Furlong isn't on it. It's closest to the school, and they don't have sidewalks either. I'm just wondering, why does our street need a sidewalk? And who recommended it? All the people on our street don't want it. <laughs> well, we can maybe, uh, yeah, Councillor Thompson, did you want to weigh in? <clears throat> yeah, I was uh, surprised to uh, see the comments. Uh, almost 100% of the people are saying they don't need a sidewalk in their area. Now, I live in uh, across from Eagle Valley uh, in the town housing project there. There's probably 120 townhouses, single family residential areas, and uh, not one sidewalk uh, in the entire development. Uh, mostly seniors in there, um, a couple of uh, children, but uh, I would really be upset if somebody said, oh, we're gonna put sidewalks because you'd cut off your front yard, uh, you'd cut off your opportunity to pull your car in uh, behind the garage to uh, uh, park. So here we got people who are saying they don't want uh, and we're always looking for uh, saving money or doing something else. Uh, I don't understand why uh, this is even here today. I would make a motion that uh, we delete the sidewalk for the area because of the residents don't want it. What's the problem? Thank okay. you. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say, maybe we could just ask staff to weigh in here. I know, I know the report was done by uh, Mr. Nickel, so I don't know, Kent, if uh, you could weigh in on, on how this project came forward and what the rationale was for it. Yeah, I can. Yeah, that'd be great, thanks. Um, the, uh, the, the project was initiated uh, due to a complaint about, uh, num number one, there was a safety concern about speeding and about um, children walking to school on the road. And uh, it is, uh, we have an ongoing new sidewalk program that uh, typically is uh, geared towards um, adding sidewalks where we have local, where we have, uh, sorry, collector arterial roads that are <coughs> under, under service. That's not the case here, it's just a local road. But it also focuses on areas where there, it's in the vicinity of schools. And uh, the other item is, is that our um, sidewalk design standards call for um, sidewalk uh, on, on all um, residential roads that uh, uh, if you've got more than 150 meters of uh, distance that you have to walk with a, a sidewalk. So. These are the reasons why this uh, project was brought forward. And uh, the other question I could ask, and then whoever has questions, uh, did, did we survey all the residents to see if that they were in favor of this, or did we do anything like that? They're already surveyed right here. Yeah. They, initially, there was, wasn't a survey undertaken. That's not been our typical pro 
practice. Um, and, and when the when the uh, public meeting was held and there was a uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the residents uh, I put a survey out. We did do a wider area survey, so we looked at uh, an area uh, of uh, uh, basically a, a buffer of 400 meters all around the street, um, and there was the deliver hand uh, delivered notices to all of them. Um, it was approximately about 700 people that were were polled. We got. Um, only 48 replies back. Granted, of course, this was happening in the last few weeks. Um, so, in, uh, and uh, the replies we got back, 32 were in favor and 16 were against. So, this is looking at the more yeah. immediate area. Obviously, I can understand people that live on the street aren't in favor of it, but sidewalks are a community-based uh, amenity. So, you have people that are walking through the neighborhood, and you know, in this case, many people don't walk because they, it is unsafe. It's the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, if you build it, they will come at it, you know. They would start using it if obviously it was a, a safe way for them to travel through this route or, uh, along this, this path. And most, uh, the, I know that the, the resident mentioned furlong. That is also on our list for consideration as part of future programming. Only have what about Champlain, Banting, Parliament, all the ones that are by Sacred Heart School? Not one of those streets has a sidewalk. Are those also... Slated. Uh, well, they, we we uh, we have uh, um, we would want to look at uh, a, a, a level of service uh, policy with respect to sidewalks citywide, and then we can identify all these areas. But this one was initially initiated, and we investigated because of the complaint that we got by resident. Yes, on resident the street on Parkway Drive. Yes, because I have a recommendation for the. All you need is a couple of speed bumps on our street to slow anybody down, one on each end, and a crosswalk at the end of Cattell and Parkway Drive for the kids going to school. Mind you, we don't have any. <laughs> Councillor Campbell? Just want to know how long ago the complaint was made. Was uh, made uh, around this time of year in uh, 2017, so two years ago. Two years. A lot of things can happen in two years. Yes. Uh, Councillor Coco. I just received a call today actually about speeding on that and I have to get back to, to the lady. It wasn't about the sidewalk, it was just about speeding. Okay, also uh, Councillor Peter Angel. Yeah, thanks Your Worship. Um, perhaps just a comment uh, maybe through you to staff. I know, um, I guess the difficult part for me is I'm a big proponent of sidewalks, uh, but I think it's a very difficult thing to then go put a sidewalk into an established street that's been there for 50 plus years. Um, I also don't agree with the fact that there are new subdivisions where we have streets that don't have sidewalks. Um, and I can give you some names of them if you like. I'm sure you know full well uh, that, that there are. So it's a difficult thing to say that we're going to allow brand new builds that don't have sidewalks and then we're going to go back while people are established and enforce sidewalks. That's the difficult part. So I mean, unless we're gonna take the attitude that every single street in, in the city of Niagara Falls is going to have a sidewalk and we're gonna enforce it in new subdivisions, it's very hard to have a policy that says that we're gonna go back and put them in established areas. Uh, uh, Councilor DeBerski. Okay, so were you here to speak to this too? We're, we're all neighbors. Oh. On the same, in the sidewalks aren't even on my side of the street. Okay, okay. <laughs> So, is there any other questions or comments? Yeah, I just want to say, yeah, you know what? It's it's. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Councilor Strange. Strange. Yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. That's good. Right. Yeah, I'm okay. You're good. Um, anyways, we're looking at, at the petition here of all the uh, the neighbors and stuff, and, and I'm sure, like you said, on Furlong, they they probably want a sidewalk. I'm not sure if they do probably or not. not. They've all lived there for 50 years too. And I'm sure there's a lot of neighborhoods where they do want to have a sidewalk, and uh, we should be obviously looking at. Uh, uh, those name neighbors and neighborhoods, and uh, you know, but it's you know, it's not senior staff's fault that they went ahead and did this. They got a complaint a couple yeah. of years ago, so they were just falling up. So it's that nobody's fault that we're coming forward with this. It's just it's better somewhere else. Yeah, and use that money to fix those fix sanitary money, problems on the town. Money to put in the sewers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. just had that. So, uh, is there any other questions or comments of council at this point? So, did uh, was there a motion? Did someone make a motion? Yeah, motion. yeah okay. So, what was your motion? Yeah. No, delete the sidewalks. Okay, motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dubrowski, that we uh, turn down this uh, 
recommendation. Deny it. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. And it's approved that it's denied. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Okay. What's next here? Okay, so 8.7. Uh, Gateway Community Improvement Plan and Municipal em Employment Incentive Program application. So we've got four recommendations here. One that Council approved the Niagara Gateway Community Improvement Program for Progress Street. Two that Council approved the use of the Community Improvement Plan citywide if reserves are required to offset the planning and building permit fees and the study grant costs, that the Niagara Region be advised of the decision, and four, that the that I be allowed to sign the agreement. Moved by recommendations. Okay, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. 8.8, .8, matters arising from Council discussion of the boarding house study in affordable housing. The recommendation is that Council receive the report as direction to staff. So, okay, moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, thank you, that's approved. Uh, 8.9, appeal of notice to repeal the designation bylaw for the former Parks Rec and Culture Building. Move that. We don't repeal. Move that. We don't repeal. Okay, so let's just, so we understand this. What did you say? That we don't repeal. Hold on, let's just... Uh, because this is for the direction, oh yeah, this is for the direction of council. Receive the file. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Thompson. Seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Any guy? Approve? Opposed? Yeah, thank you. Very Unopposed, much. thank you. Item, uh, okay, we have the consent agenda. What's the desire of council? We'll Councillor. Okay, first we've got Council Coco. Did you want to lift something, Council? Yes, with I'd like to pull RNC 2019 20, the Wall of Fame. Okay, do you want to just deal with that one right now? We'll just sure, yes. go ahead. Thank you. One second, please. I just wanted to pull it to congratulate the Arts and Culture Wall of Fame honorees, which are Karen Fraser, Joan Howitston, Kevin and Michael McMahon, and Christina LaRose. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Move moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Dabrowski that we move the consent agenda. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. So what's that take us down to, Mr. Clerk? 10.1. <laughs> okay, okay. 10.1. Uh, we have a resolution request for the provincial response to address gas well issues in Norfolk County. Oh, Norfolk. Yeah, just thinking, uh, just we receive and file that one, I would think. Moved by Councillor Cario. Yeah. Sec yes. what? Second by Councillor Peter Angel that we receive the report. All the resolution all those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Yeah, Moving along. 10.2. We're just second, on. second, sir. I'm sorry. No, I, I met actually the uh, the mayor of Norfolk, Crystal uh, Chop up at um, Amo. She's yeah. a huge, huge fan of yours. I was telling Yeah, I don't know if you got a chance to meet her or not, but she was awesome. And I was wearing my BNF uh, hat and shirt, and she's like, oh, B Norfolk. <laughs> so she wants to know if she can get a shirt and a hat. She loves you. She loves uh, that yeah. that hat and shirt. She thought it was all in Norfolk, but can I just make a motion that we send oh, yeah. a shirt and a hat on behalf of uh, the Mayor and City Council? Okay, that's good. No, you do a good job. Yeah. So okay, motion by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, that we send a BNF shirt and hat. To Norfolk, so they could use our. Do we have any stock? You know. Um, I'll have to check. I'll have to check. Councilor Peter Angelo, do we have any more in stock? Uh, red. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. I'm sure they're going to appreciate that. Item 10.2, the resolution never forgotten national memorial, the council resolution of the town of Bradbury, West Willenbury. Support the resolution. Supporting the resolution. Yeah. Okay, moved by Councillor Peter Angel, seconded by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. You have to tell me where that town is though, Councillor. Where exactly is it? <laughs> All right, item 10.3. Special occasion permit request for Camp Park Resor Resort. Special Han occasion permit. Thank you. And Hot Manor, uh, we support that. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Item 10.4. We have correspondence from the region from Ron Tripp. Uh, receive and file by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Campbell. 
All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. 10.5 noise ball exemption for, for proposed road closure on St. James Street. Yep. Moved by Councillor Strange. Seconded by Councillor um, Dabrowski. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Item 10.6 so noise moved. bylaw exemption for Taps Brewery uh, for a number of occasions, a number of dates. So moved by Councillor Thompson. Seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Item 10.7 resolution regarding municipal amalgamation. Okay. Received. <laughs> Received uh, and filed from Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. How come you put me first this time? Because <laughs> you guys have got me back and forth. You got me spun around. Okay, 10.8, uh, 10 10 sorry. I'm sorry, Councillor uh, Lococo, did you want to speak to this? Yes, I did. Thank you. I know we're always looking for different opportunities for affordable housing and when I first saw this about the vacant home tax, I thought, oh, maybe that's a good idea. I reached out to Councillor Strange as a real estate agent to talk to him about what are some of the challenges in our area. And actually he was out cutting the grass thinking, why are we going to penalize people? Maybe we should come up with some incentives. So I reached out to a couple of organizations to come up with some ideas. Um, some of them are to have a database of tenants and they would go through a program on how to be a good tenant about how to pay their their rent on time how to maintain the home how to do budgeting um, they would be pre-screened there would be there could be a um, database for the landlords and um, maybe one of the benefits could be that the rent would be pre-authorized to go right to the landlord so that's a guarantee there as well there were some other things about um, supporting the landlords maybe there could be some funds for damages um, co-sharing there was a great program in toronto where seniors and students were co-sharing it allowed the seniors to stay in their homes a little bit longer it gave them some help and some money and then on the other side of the students the students <coughs> didn't want to be part of the the school um, dormitory experience they wanted to to be outside of that, they pay a lesser amount in rent and they're able to, to live in a home and help someone. And then we thought about, well, if we can do that with seniors and students, why don't we do it for all generations? So there could be co-sharing. There's a lot of people that are living in homes that have one, two bedrooms that are vacant. So those are some of the ideas. And what I would like to do is put a motion forward um, that the City of Niagara Falls investigate options to help alleviate the housing crisis, such as working with a nonprofit to provide incentives such as landlord database, ten tenant database, tenant course for life skills, direct payment of rent, co-sharing for seniors and students, co-sharing for all ages, a damage funds, and any other solutions. Okay, so, but this is not directly in relation to the St. Catharines motion? No. Okay, so why don't we do this first? Okay, let's take yours. So we have a motion. Did everyone hear the motion by Councillor Lococo uh, to help? Could, the, could you just repeat that again, uh, Mr. Clark, sure. so you can? I have it written down for Okay, the well, just so, because I need a seconder, too. That the City of Niagara Falls investigate options to help alleviate the housing crisis, such as working with a nonprofit, provide incentives such as landlord database, tenant database, tenant course for life skills, direct payment of rent, co-share for senior students, co-share all ages, damages fund, and any other solutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, moved by Councillor uh, Lococo, second. Are you? Can conflict? Oh, conflict, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I'll second, but I'll speak to it as well. Yeah, yeah, when I was talking about, you know, when I go through real estate and you always hear, and, and I heard about St. Catharines, they want to charge a, a, a vacant home tax for someone that have, has uh, two homes because basically there's no rental there. Um, and they're doing it in BC across the whole province. If you have a second home and it stays vacant, they charge you between uh, point a half percent and two percent per year and some homes are worth five ten million dollars so um, but I think you, you if you if you look at it you shouldn't be um, you know can we just start with her motion though first yeah yeah, yeah for sure okay. no, I'm just talking we shouldn't be punishing people for having vacant homes so just trying to help and help incentivize these people who right. have second homes and they can actually um, not have to go through the Tenancy Act because they don't want to rent. Instead, go through regional housing or something where they can help some someone that's on the uh, on, on a listing waiting for housing. So that's all I'm suggesting. So are you seconding her? I am seconding. 
Yes. Yes, Councilor Pietrangelo. Yeah, Your Worship. I, I, I don't disagree. The only question I would have is, um, is the councillor suggesting that we as a city take, take this on? And do we need to dedicate staff to do this? Or are we going to pass this up to social housing at the region? Uh, I think it's important to answer that question. Okay, so why don't we ask No, that you? wasn't the suggestion. The suggestion okay. was to work with a nonprofit, whether it be local or regional, just to investigate the opportunities. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we have that motion. All those in favor? Okay and a conflict so that's approved and how about we just receive the st catherine's yeah thank you uh moved by councillor Cario, second by councillor strange all those in favor okay thank you i i was speaking with the mayor about that today and i said do you have a problem in st catherine's with empty houses and i said because that's news to me and, and i know that vancouver they do but that's a total different situation people from hong kong own houses that they don't live in mm -hmm. but here we don't have that problem so I was surprised that, that they made, I get the certain things. That one I didn't quite, I was asking them to help me understand it. Um, 10.9, uh, Department of Canadian Heritage. Um, so let me just get this one here. Sorry, it's not calling, coming up on my screen. Oh, here we go. So uh, this one here, Mr. Clerk, can you help me with this one? Recommendation for, it's just for the information of council regarding, uh, right. So uh, that's regarding our, uh, our money that we received for our, uh, Culture Hub and Farmers Market. So received by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor, and that's approved. Thank you. 10.10, uh, .10, Town of Grimsby, whistleblowing uh, policy. Steve. Looking to receive the move by Councillor Thompson that we receive. Second. Seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor, that's approved. Thank you. Item 10.11, proclamation request for wrongful conviction day. Okay, that's for Wednesday, October the 2nd, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski, that October the 2nd be wrongful conviction day. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. It seems every day of the year it has a designation now, right? <laughs> There's so many now. Okay, in camera, Mr. Clerk, do we have anything to ratify? Uh, no ratification from tonight's meeting. However, you'll see on the uh, open session of your agenda, that uh, report VDD 2019-03 dealing with the Niagara Falls Ryerson Innovation Hub proposal. Uh, we're just looking now that there's been a federal announcement uh, that was made back on September 3rd. We just need a formal motion of council to adopt uh, mainly recommendation number one in that report. Move report. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski that we move the three recommendations in the Niagara Falls Ryerson Innovation Hub proposal. All those in favor? That's proved. Finally, we did it. We pulled that one off. We've been working on that one for how many years? That is great news. Pardon me? And that was unanimous. Yeah, that was unanimous. First, second, and third reading of the bylaws. Okay. Uh, first, second, and third reading of the bylaws. Moved by Councilor Peter Angelo. Second by Councilor Dabrowski. All those in favor? That's approved. Mr. Clerk. And now we move into new business. <coughs> Councilor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. I just have uh, one question I'd like to... Uh, direct the staff, I did receive a uh, phone call from a concerned uh, neighbor in the area of the Patrick Cummings Park in Chippewa. Um, it's not so much a problem in the summertime when the park is being used, but apparently in the winter fall months when it's not being used, the uh, uh, access to the park by cross country motor vehicles, cycles and such is creating a problem, noise problem, for the people that back onto the uh, park. I did drive by the park uh, uh, at the one end, and there's a big solid steel bar across there blocking entrance of vehicles, but on either side of that bar, there's nothing to stop oh. motorcycles or all-terrain vehicles from going through. The question mm -hmm. is, can we, uh, uh, stop access in the off-season months to that park. Now, are you talking Willoughby entrance? Or? Willoughby entrance, that's one I, where I saw. Okay. But uh, I have to assume that they're coming through that, that area because the other end is... Uh, Resi residential. Residential, yeah. So do you want to make a motion that we have staff report back on that then? Well, I would like to have staff look at it. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I don't think we need to report back. I think we'll get staff out and have a look at it. We'll do, we have to put some other boulders or barriers here. We'll Perfect. Thank okay. you. Great. Thank you for that. Do you need a motion for that or no? We're good. Okay. We're good. Uh, Councillor Thompson and then LaCoco. 
Um, at the last meeting, um, I made a motion and uh, it was brought to my attention that uh, it was uh, inappropriate, the motion, and I was thinking uh, that uh, I hadn't really read that report or saw the report and a uh, petition regarding Bridgewater Street and uh, for a couple of years, i had been hearing from people uh, on Bridgewater uh, right off of uh, Portage Road where there's a stoned area and there's commercial on the other side of Bridgewater <coughs> and people were wanting to park there and there was some controversy about not being able to park there. The stone goes down for probably a full block which uh, is wide enough for a car. And people were calling me uh, in the area saying, why can't we park there? I think there is parking there now. So when the uh, topic was brought up and uh, they talked about parking on the stone area, I immediately thought that that's what they were talking about. And I jumped up and made the motion for approval. And uh, I quickly found out that that wasn't the case at all. There, and I'm uh, very familiar with Bridgewater in Chippewa. Uh, it's the first one along the creek on the uh, south side. And I had a home there and uh, a beautiful dock right on the river, which I enjoyed. Uh, and I was always told you cannot park in the grassed area and uh, nobody did that. So what these people are talking about uh, in the uh, uh, petition uh, was to park uh, two areas um, in the green area where nobody else uh, is permitted to park. So I shouldn't have move the motion and I would like to uh, um, reverse my decision on that and withdraw my motion and I would like to refer this to staff because there's a whole section of people who were not contacted about two private driveways on the green area. It's, it's uh, somebody uh, uh, unusual, taking advantage of this situation. And uh, so I would like to have uh, this referred back to staff to come back with a report after they've surveyed the area. Uh, in the green area, uh, the city owns, uh, I think, 12 feet along there, and the rest of it is Ontario Hydro. and. Uh, Two driveways were put in stoned area. Everybody else is green grass. So uh, I would like to have this uh, investigated and uh, brought back to city council, uh, notifying the residents so that they can respond and we can get a decision which is fair and equitable to everybody along. Because if you approve that decision that we made, that I moved last time, then everybody all the way along there would spoil the beautiful view, the open view of the creek by parking cars over there. Well, that right now, staff are already doing a study. They're coming back with a report on that whole section. Well, we approved the motion. And I know, but the, and, and Mr. Dren can give us more information, but at the last <coughs> council review meeting, it was brought forward that they're, we did, but it, they're doing a full report. Mr. Dren, could you update us on that? Yes, just update you. It's it's in conjunction with uh, Councillor Thompson. Uh, we had a meeting with him to discuss this, and we indicated that we would come back with the report. Right. He indicated that he was going to bring it to Council's attention to say that he wanted the motion that was put in at the previous Council. Uh, he wanted to withdraw that motion and put this new motion in. <coughs> if, if we let this stand, everybody 
would be able to put in the driveway in the green area uh, all the way along the creek. I think that's unacceptable. And then well, they blame it all on you. But that's yeah. not that that's not what the motion that's yeah, not what the mo what yeah that's not what the motion was yeah. at all. Because right now you can parallel park along there anyway, so you can block no, the view all no, day I'm, long. No, I'm they can park on the asphalt area. Right, but block the view. No, it, well, they can do that, yes. But what's happening with this other the motion, people put stone area where the permanent parking area on the green area, not on the asphalt. Right. So those stones have been there, I know, for several years, the, the gravel. And, and those stones have been there. The motion that you had made was where they're, because they've been currently parking there on those <coughs> stoned areas, that they, that can continue. And staff, in the meantime, are doing a report no. to res No, in fact, if you talk to Mr. Brown, he heard when one of these things was being put in, he went out and told them, no, you cannot do that. And they uh, told him to put the grass back on. And after Mr. Brown left, uh, it was stoned again. How long ago was that, Mr. John? So uh, through, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, basically what they've done is created perpendicular parking areas. Right. So uh, they did it without any permission. Um, they were, uh, the original perpendicular areas were put in place during construction and they were supposed to be removed. They never removed them. What they did is started using them. And there's a lot of businesses in the area that are using them to, to store their business vehicles. And so uh, when the petition first came in last time, it was very skewed. It came from one group of people uh, and it didn't take into account everyone. So what we're doing is uh, through our process, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a process where we survey and it's confidential, and we address it in that confidential way. So it's to uh, look at the perpendicular parking, not the parallel parking. So parallel is acceptable. This is a perpendicular, which is eating into the uh, greenery that's, that's But there. there's a lot bigger issue at stake. It's not parking. Fire, can't get a fire truck down there with parallel parking on both sides. You got a safety issue? Yeah. You got a lot of issues down there, so that's why you need a staff report, right? Correct, and, and we're going to look at where, when, when we do a report like that, we involve the fire department. Uh, the end result might be a, a, a restriction on one side of the road uh, that would allow fire trucks to access to that area. So <laughs> that we're going to have an exacerbated problem because we already have a parking problem on that street. Will you, will you have a relative that's involved in this? I think you do, though. Huh? I think you do. No, I don't. I heard from the people. That they're very well, upset. The other thing is, what petition? It takes every single person ever. No petitions do that. You don't get negative anyway, contrary what petitions. What we're doing is having a report That's right. back. That's right. We're going to have a report with back. With the That's staff right. uh, yep. looking into it and making rec recommendations. Exactly. Councilor Peter Angelo, did you uh, have something else? for the report. I think, uh, sorry. I think Mr. Dren uh, just commented on what I was going to say is that I thought that we allowed the uh, perpendicular to the road parking um, as opposed to uh, what Councilor Thompson was talking about in regards to the private lots. Uh, that's what I thought that Council had approved that night. So yeah. unless I uh, misunderstood. So yeah. Anyway, I made a motion to get the report back. Yep. Okay, motion by Councilor uh, Thompson to get the report uh, brought to Council, seconded by Councilor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Okay, thank you. Anyway, um, I have uh, another situation uh, <coughs> on uh, Center Street. Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Shahani yep. owns a restaurant there, and the right behind there's an alleyway, and uh, she uh, has been calling me steady about she would like to have this referred the staff to talk with the business people in the area and there's the city parking lot adjacent to that so I would so move that that be second yeah. yes um, it's already taken care of I think through your office I'm sorry I think it's already no no she I met with no. her as well yeah and I said we have to deal with it through council we got oh, okay. this morning. 
Yeah, because yeah, what's happening, they're getting a lot of parking tickets. Yeah. Yeah. The proprietors are getting uh, tickets and um, they want to have a designated parking spot and they want to negotiate that with the city, even if they have to pay to lease a spot. But they said, we'd rather do that and get tickets. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so, so the motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, that staff meet with Ms. Shahani to look into another parking spot for them. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Uh, Councillor LeCoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In August, many of us attended the AMO conference. I learned a lot and was able to connect with a lot of people to learn different things that are going on in their communities. There was a lot of great ideas out there and they really encouraged us to do a lot of R&D and it was um, rip off and duplicate. <laughs> so <laughs> if you know of ideas, you can bring them in here without starting from scratch. Um, Councillor Iannone and I attended a lot of sessions regarding homelessness, housing, and the drug crisis. And one of the things that really became apparent to me in our registration bag, 2,400 people got a naloxone kit, and it encouraged you to go to the naloxone booth to get another one and to learn more about it and become a naloxone ready community. We are number two, the Niagara region is number two to Brantford. That's a really bad list to be on. Um, so I did get a lot of naloxone kits. They, they made some smaller ones so they're not so big. There's the harder case ones. And then we actually attended a lunch where they gave you a full kit. So the idea is to become a naloxone ready community. And I did speak with Mrs. Moldenhauer about our city buildings. And I'd like to put forward a, a motion um, that the city of Niagara Falls become a naloxone ready city by placing the naloxone kits in all of our major city buildings and that the staff have appropriate training. Positive Living in St. Catharines emailed me today and they are willing to give us the kits and provide the training. And then she also mentioned, she wasn't sure at the beginning of the conversation, but she thought that maybe the <coughs> fire trucks did not have them and maybe if the chief could comment on that for me, please. Chief? Mr. Mayor, to, uh, through you to the councilor. Um, there's only one fire department in the Niagara region that carries naloxone and that's St. Catharines. We operate under a medical director and the medical director is advised all the fire departments that naloxone is not the answer to overdoses on opioids. Um, the answer to opioids in his medical opinion is that firefighters that arrive on the scene are very good at doing airway breathing and circulation and that's what's required to save someone that's under a drug overdose. Okay. So we've, we've chosen to go down that route. Um, we have very good success with that. The other thing is, is when you awaken someone that is under a, an opioid or an overdose with an naloxone, they have a tendency to come up swinging, which puts the danger back into the staff. So I do have a concern with that, not only in my fire services, but the city staff. Uh, we could potentially get seriously hurt. The other side of it from a medical perspective is that if we do airway breathing circulation, EMS will arrive on scene. EMS's administration of naloxone is deteriorating as far as the use because they're trying to keep the patient unconscious, breathing, and quiet so nobody gets hurt. What happens is they titrate the um, naloxone in, which keeps the patient at a nice even keel. The hospital does the same thing. They, they titrate that in, they keep the patient unconscious, they let the, let the opioid dissipate, and then the patient wakes up and they can get them help through mental guidance, mental uh, stress, uh, consultings or counseling, and it gets them into the system. When you wake people up using naloxone, they usually run or bolt because they don't want to be looked at by different people or arrested by the police department. And what happens is after 20 minutes, the naloxone wears off, the opioid kicks back in, and the patient dies, and they're now with their friends and they're found somewhere hours, days later, and it's too late. So from a fire service, we've made a very conscious decision to go with our medical director uh, and stay the course of doing our, what we do best there, we breathe in circulation. Maybe a suggestion, Councillor, that we ask for a report to come yeah, back? I was fine with that. I respect the Chief's okay. experience, yes. Okay, so motion by um, Councillor Coco, second by Councillor Dabrowski, that we ask staff to come back with a naloxone report on city facilities. Just uh, give a nice report. That was good. <laughs> but if you could just type it out for us, that was good. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Anything else, Councillor? 
Sorry. No, no, no. It's good. Councilor Coco. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I had one more. Easy, boy. Easy, Easy Tiger. Tiger. Three or four. I've had quite a few complaints regarding a construction method. It's um, where there's styrofoam up and then that they sand it and they put a stucco type of um, concrete on top of it. I, I've seen it um, a few years ago around my house actually and it was two stories and they, they have a scaffold and they put this, this green mesh that goes all the way down to the ground and when they sand it all of the styrofoam goes down to the bottom. But even still when they did that, that styrofoam was going everywhere. It was blocks away and people were complaining. So there, there are a few issues of air quality. It gets into the sewers, so that is a city, um, city issue and litter. Um, I know the Minister of Environment did come down regarding that specific building, and there's another building in the area that's happening the same thing. So I have talked with um, Director of Planning, Mr. Herlovich, and maybe he can speak to it from his point of view, but I would like to get a, um, a report to see what other communities are doing. The Minister of Environment was suggesting that we look at it from a site plan perspective, that when we are putting construction site plans together to minimize the litter, the air quality, and the, the water um, litter and environmental issues. So that, that's what I would like to look at. Maybe Mr. Hrlovich can speak on his behalf. Uh, Mr. Hrlovich, I'm not sure if uh, you want to comment or? Well, I don't know if you <laughs> Council wants to report back, or you want me to basically tell you what I told Council Lococo today, which is air quality is a ministry of the environment and uh, conservation and parks, M M E C P, used to be Ministry of Environment. Um, and so they have been down to at least one of those sites, perhaps both sites that she's speaking to. They have spoken to the builder about retaining the uh, materials on this site, suggested that they, uh, you know, during windy conditions, they work on parts of the building where this won't be blowing onto the property. Um, it's all well and good that the Ministry of Environment staff says, put it in your site plan. Uh, basically, they're now downloading their responsibility onto municipal staff, and we don't have the resources. <coughs> While we have municipal site plan um, agreements, uh, those agreements are you know, that they put in the appropriate lighting, that they put in curbs, that they put in sewers uh, to meet municipal standards. And we go out and inspect at certain points. But we really don't have staff resources that can go out there every day to monitor as to whether or not they're raking up styrofoam bits or whether small particles, one to two millimeters was reported, are blowing in the wind and landing three blocks away. Um, if we were even to try and um, enforce that, um, you know, who is to say that our staff picks up a piece of styrofoam and says, hey, it came from your building. And they say, well, it didn't come from our building. Maybe it came from the other building that's down the street. Or maybe somebody says it didn't blow away. Uh, someone picked it up and dropped it down. You know, trying to get a prosecution, near impossible. Um, M-O-E-C-P or M-E-C-P has been going out there. I think they're doing their job. My recommendation is we let them do their job. Second the motion. The motion? Is that a motion by Mr. Rubin? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Council. Well, I, I was going to make a motion that we look at what other communities are doing because I do think it, it's a city issue. It is going into our water system. It is, um, maybe the Minister of Environment does cover air, but it is, I think, partially our responsibility. They were there over a week ago. They said that they would mitigate. They didn't mitigate. It was still being blown around. Um, they've gone again. They came up with some different type of mitigation, and it's still going three blocks away. So once, once they're doing it, it's a long process, and there's styrofoam all over the place, and it's not biodegradable. You know, I wonder if this is an Ontario Building Code uh, thing, because all new construction is done this way, commercial and residential, right? They put the styrofoam, and then they sand the styrofoam, mm -hmm. and it blows everywhere, and it dissipates, but it goes somewhere. Cause, and I don't know what the answer is, but, I, but it, because it's housing, I wonder if it's a building code. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know if we have any, you know. I agree it's an issue. I don't know where the issue lies, though, uh, as far as regulation. Um, what do you, what, 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 uh, pardon me? Refer to staff. I don't mind seeing what other municipalities do. Okay, why don't we do that then? So you want to make that motion? Okay, thank counsel? you. I will make that motion. We refer it to staff to see what other municipalities are doing. Okay. 
uh, moved by Councillor Coco, second by Councillor Pierangelo. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. Any other ones, uh, Councillor Coco? No. That's it. Okay, Councillor Strange. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Mayor, you mentioned a couple times uh, um, today about the Innovation Hub and um, getting approval and stuff, and I was like, we got, I think we need a little bit more of a reaction to it because it, it's taken a while that we got that. We had been tight, we had been tight lipped about it for the last uh, few weeks. We had in camera and kind of celebrated in camera a bit that it was going through, but we couldn't say anything until the feds approved. But I just want to congratulate everybody yeah. here. I know a lot of people have been on this. On this uh, uh, in this council chamber is like you know Vince and Vic Wayne Wayne yourself uh, and we're newcomers right but they've been trying for years and years and I know it didn't happen by yourself you had Ken and Serge Dale and all senior staff so uh, it's great that uh, everything is finally going downtown and I think everyone thought it was going to be some kind of dream but we, but we made it reality together so kudos to everyone well, you know what? I appreciate it. yeah let's do it. You know, I'd like to do maybe, uh, Mr. Felicetti, our Director of uh, Economic Development, maybe, can you just give us a little bit of, uh, you've been there since the beginning, Serge, you've been uh, making things happen, it's been a whole, I know, big team effort, but could you just kind of give the Council uh, and the viewers on Kojiko a little bit of a flavor? It's significant what happened. It's not insignificant. Maybe you could give a little flavor of what just happened, what's been announced, and what's going to happen next. Yeah, obviously uh, we were pleased with the feds uh, coming to the table. We had uh, your mic on. Is round. your mic on? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's on. Okay, good. Um, Thank you. So we, this was our, our second round. Our first application was uh, was actually declined, but we got some good advice from our partners, which was Ryerson, because when they started the DMZ zone, which today is the number one incubator in the world, they accelerate probably more more companies than other. Uh, innovation hub and so to partner with them uh, they said listen you just got to start you got to start you got to show the feds what you're trying to accomplish and so council and their foresight we had a chance to partner with spark uh, with Dino Mealy who's one of our partners in the hub and he had launched uh, a small incubator and they were looking for a home so we we went and met with him well, a couple years ago now uh, when the first application was denied and asked to be part of this process so we met with them and Ryerson, and together we resubmitted the application. And it was to accomplish a number of things, and a number of things that councils had on their radar for as strategic objectives. One is youth retention. I know that in camera, and unfortunately we don't have it with us tonight, but we showed council a video of some of the young uh, entrepreneurs that are now in that hub launching companies and are doing quite well. This, this, these dollars, and with the city matching these dollars over the next four years, really takes it to the next level. And also partnering with Ryerson, they have hubs in, in New York City, in China, in Israel. So these companies automatically get connected to these other hubs in terms of uh, new opportunities from a marketing perspective. And vice versa, there's companies in those hubs that might want to get into the North American marketplace where they're going to use Niagara Falls as a soft landing zone. So they'll come and operate out of our hub. And the whole idea is to give them the support here. And then from there, they accelerate into parts of our community. So they, when they start to launch their company, they hire people, they leave the hub, and we get them uh, locations in the city. And so there's, a, there's also programs that are taking place because our world is quickly becoming very digital. And we talk about coding and everything we, we do today. And so they're actually working with the, the school system to run coding camps out of the hub. And it's been very successful. And this kind of starts getting the whole idea of coding and the STEM process that these kids are learning in school uh, out of the hub and, and talk about entrepreneurship and, and the opportunities of them owning and operating their own business at a very young age. So it's a whole ecosystem that's created there. And working with our partners, we're feeling very confident that we're going to see a, l a number of companies come out of that hub and reposition themselves in the city and hire a job. And the great thing when you're, when you're really incubating local firms is that once they're from this community, uh, you don't tend to see locally bred firms depart. They might expand, but they always seem to keep their core here. Where with multinationals, sometimes you don't get that, that same situation. And also it helps drive small business, because rather than having one company with a thousand employees, it's great to see 20 with 50. 
And so we think that uh, this is going to have some real positive impacts on the downtown because we see in, in terms of with the GO train and connectivity to Toronto through the GO train and, and some of these companies moving it on Queen Street, some of the digital companies, we're going to see revitalization of the downtown as part of one of the objectives, youth retention and diversifying the economy. So it was, uh, as you said, there was a lot of people involved, a lot of great partners, and we're started, uh, very excited about moving this thing forward now. That's great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Serge. Uh, are you done, Councillor? Yeah. Okay. Councillor Peter Angel. Just on the same issue, Your Worship, I think the only thing I want to mention is uh, part of the biggest benefit that I see is, that I, is the diversification aspect. I mean, I know every time we go through an election, we always get the questionnaire from the Chamber of Commerce that says, how, as a municipal official, are you going to diversify the economy? And I think that this is actually a great way to do it. I mean, because you're incubating businesses, you don't know that the person that's coming in is going to be, you know, in light industrial, in heavy industrial, in manufacturing, in green, or even in the tech industry. So I, I think diversification is really the exciting thing, not to mention the jobs that come along with it. So kudos to yourself and, uh, and our CAO, Ken Todd, and also uh, to Serge Felicetti and Dale Morton. Well, and it was this council made it a priority and stuck with it. I know there's a lot of times we could have just bailed on it, but we stuck with it. And so it's worked out great now. Any other new business? Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. You have more? No, you already went. Yeah, more. Yeah. 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 What do you think? Well, we need a motion. Do we allow? Do we allow second chances or what? Is it a relative? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, did you want to do yours? Or did, and then we'll go back to... Yeah, Your Worship, I just want to know where we are with the 405. <laughs> I just want to know where we are with the 405. I know we went to AMO. We had four different meetings set up. Uh, we talked about uh, the hospital. We talked about gaming. We met the Minister for Social Housing. And it was the uh, South End Sewage Treatment Plant. Um, the 405, I know there was a meeting with the Minister of Transportation uh, at AMO but it wasn't one for the city of Niagara Falls. I think it was something for the region. Yeah. So, I mean, if we're gonna do something, we need to get in front of the minister. We need to have a meeting. We also need to get the region to see uh, what we see. And I and I, I really see problems with getting off at, uh, at concession six, your worship, and, and, and putting an exit there. So, um, what do we do to move this forward? Can we get a meeting with the minister? That's a great idea, and you know what? Um, we're going to do that, so we'll set something up to the CAO and, and uh, uh, Serge and myself. We'll, we'll set that up. We did send a letter, Mr. Clerk. Could you update us on the status of that letter? Yeah, that uh, letter was sent out, and we've actually received uh, word back from them this week that uh, they're willing to meet. So if, if you are uh, having staff follow up with that, um, they're open to the dialogue. Okay, and, and that's the Ministry of Transportation? Yeah. Okay, and prior to that, Your Worship, is there any chance of the City of Niagara Falls getting together with perhaps, uh, um, I guess, the people who would be making the recommendation at the region to have, uh, I guess, a united front when we go to the Minister of Transportation? I don't want to go there and, and kind of make our pitch, and the region is making their pitch. They're the higher level of government. Um, I'd rather that, uh, you know, you get a chance to talk to Yes. the Lord Mayor of Niagara-on-the-Lake and also the Mayor of St. Catharines, and I'm sure that they would be very supportive of the idea of making the 405 fully functional. So we did, um, following up on your motion, we did send that letter to the region as well, yep. and uh, we're trying to get it put on the agenda for regional endorsement of making 405 fu fully functional. That's great. Okay. Yeah. So you know when that's coming? Uh, I don't, I don't. And um, Ron Tripp is away this week, yes. so, um, but, but we can follow up and maybe the clerk can make a note and uh, we'll follow up with, uh, with the region and as well we'll set up something with the MTO and we'll get up to Queen's Park and make that happen. Okay, all right, thanks your worship. That's I'll great. Wait to hear back. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, for a fifth time. <laughs> basically a couple of times um, and I didn't know anything about 5G and I have been trying to uh, bring myself up to date on what this is all about and uh, it's extremely complicated. It's being discussed all over the world and all municipalities and countries are talking about it but there is a great deal of negativity with respect to moving forward with this issue with respect to health 
issues, and I would really like an opportunity to have staff bring in uh, some report with respect to this, what we're doing, what is happening with it all over, and uh, have a discussion with respect to uh, what it's all about. Well, I, I can address that. So we did have um, staff come in and give us a, a broad, a broad uh, point overview. And Councillor Lacocco is organizing something right now on the 5G. Is that that's coming up? Councillor, did you want to just update? September 30th at the McBain Center, I think from 6.30 to 9. I'm not sure on the times. They're just in the process of putting the poster together. So once it is ready, I will send it out to everybody they're going to have a two-hour presentation and then come here on october 1st to do a 10-minute presentation at council uh, ca prevent cancer now and um, a past president of microsoft frank clegg i think that's great thank you you're welcome thank you because i have been trying to get up to date but uh, reading all this negativity it is a little bit scary so that's great um, the other thing is, uh, what? What? Oh, another thing. You said just one. Yeah. Oh, what's going on? No, I have one more. Well, your microphone is your microphone on? No, it's not. No, it's not. Oh, it's better start over. Here. Yeah, I'm just doing <laughs> Okay, I want to talk about the 5G. <laughs> anyway, it has been five minutes. Never mind. 5G. I, I, I was happy, happy to see the notice about the uh, South End. Water wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, and uh, I think it's been a long time coming. I think uh, Councillor Peter Angelo was uh, pushing on that and brought it up several times, and now it uh, looks like it's a reality. The only problem is uh, we have been working as staff uh, to try to make sure that marine land. Uh, is progressing and uh, is going to be retained as a theme park and uh, I got a call from uh, people connected with marine land I'm not going to say who but uh, the relatives? they have uh, give them a notice that they want to locate uh, <coughs> one of the sites on marine land uh, how can this even be thought about. I used to live on Swayze Drive uh, in a condominium and the sewage treatment plant uh, about a quarter of a mile away. And I tell you, in the summertime and the hot weather, uh, you could hardly sit outside with the stench. So now we're trying to look after marine land and make sure it expands and is uh, sold to somebody who is going to make it a world-class theme park and, and now they're suggesting maybe one of the sites that they're looking at is marine land uh, i would be against that a hundred percent well it's either that or eagle valley they're looking at the two eagle yeah. valley or uh, marine land uh, well, I've lived with it before. So. Uh, our CAO is going to address this. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, we've had uh, some meeting, uh, preliminary meetings with the region, and what I can say is that uh, they're investigating sites uh, along the Welland River. Um, there may be other properties owned by Marine Land. I'm not sure, but it is not. It's it's not on the Marine Land property. Any of the sites that have been discussed. So, definitely not on Marine Land. Well, there, any of the sites they're talking about are sites along the Welland River. Okay, could you check that out and uh, let uh, uh, yeah. Mr. Burns know? Mm -hmm. Because he's very upset about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. He's on the, on the Simpsons. He's on the Simpsons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Motion for adjournment. Moved by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? <laughs> And we're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> what? <laughs>